Shooters. Bill is a big fan of yours, too. Bill Cole. Yeah, it was great to see him. Bill Cole was a great shooter. And I said to him, I said, Dan might be looking at a picture of fans. He says, it wasn't coming, coming by. Yeah, thank you. How is he? How's he doing? Yeah. We're always in the middle of drama there. Because it's a tough hike in the gentleman made the race. Who, 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 yeah, he's like going to be in the Do you have a candidate? Good morning, folks. I'm David Greenfield. I have the privilege of chairing as the Land Use Chair. And today, for our Land Use Committee meeting of October 26, 2017, we have quite a few items on the agenda, including some legislation. We have a couple of other hearings that are concurrent. And we have some council members who are wrapping up those hearings and will be here in just a few minutes. So we're going to wait just a few more minutes until those council members arrive so they can fully participate in this hearing. Thank you for your patience. Members like I, I'm like holy crap! What does this mean? I'm like surfing. really funny. Well, it was complicated, that's for sure. Yeah. And I studied it for four years, so I didn't come to it. But, but in, in, our, in our area, there's no problem with the air rights. No, 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 no. How do you do that? Air rights transfers, <laughs> generating funds, governing groups, the whole thing. Yeah, it's complicated. Took subway improvements, and real estate development.
One, two, check, check. Good morning. Apologies once again for the delay. My name is David Greenfield. I'm the council member for the 44th District in Brooklyn. I'm privileged to serve as the chair of the Land Use Committee. I want to welcome my esteemed colleagues who are members of the committee and who have joined us today. Council member Pama, council member Karodnik, council member and chair Ku, council member Lander, council member Rose, council member and chair Richards, council member Cohen, council member Reynoso, council member Torres, council member Gredenshe, council member and chair Salamanca. I also want to recognize that we've been joined by council member Espinal who is sponsoring a piece of legislation that we're also having a hearing on today, which is an urban agriculture legislation that we're going to hear more about in just a few minutes. I want to specifically thank Chair Salamanca, Chair Richards, and Chair Koo for their outstanding work in our land use subcommittees. Today we're going to start this hearing, which is going to be a lengthy hearing, by voting on the items referred out from those subcommittees. After the vote, we will hold hearings on three pieces of legislation that are on the agenda. If anyone wishes to testify on the legislation before us today, please see the Sergeant at Arms immediately and complete an appearance slip. The first piece of legislation that we will be having a hearing on today, also want to just recognize that we've been joined by Councilmember Rodriguez, is introduction number 1661. That's the legislation I was referring to by Councilmember Espinal at the request of Brooklyn Borough President, a local law in relation to developing a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. Urban agriculture has become a hot topic in urban planning in recent years. This bill would require the Department of City Planning to develop a plan for incorporating this industry into New York City's land use framework. The second bill we will be hearing today is introduction number 1685 by Councilmember Chin. This is a local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to exempting certain government entities from pre-application requirements for zoning text amendments. 
In 2013, the Department of City Planning promulgated rules providing that an applicant must follow a pre-application process prior to filing a land use application. These rules provide a measure of certainty to potential applicants by placing deadlines on the Department of City Planning responses to applicant submissions. However, the codification of the deadlines can sometimes prevent a potential applicant from filing for months or even years. Introduction 1685 would allow the mayor and mayoral agencies, borough presidents, and the land use committee of the city council upon a two-thirds vote upon, of its members to opt out of this pre-application process when filing a zoning tax amendment other than an application for changes in the designation of zoning districts. The third bill we will be hearing is a proposed introduction number 1692A, which is a local law to amend the administrative code of the city of New York in relation to technical corrections to local law 116 for the year 2017. As you may remember, earlier this year, we passed legislation codifying a def definition of privately owned public spaces, also known as POPs, which impose signage requirements on all POPs owners and require the city to inspect POPs for compliance with zoning and other applicable laws. The law that went into effect on October 19th, this legislation would make minor technical corrections to the law and would make violation of its provisions subject to the same penalties that apply to the POPs created pursuing to the zoning resolution. We will now begin the discussion of the vote on a number of land use items before we go on to hearing the bills that I just described. So we're moving on to voting on several land use items. To be clear, we're not going to be voting on the items that we're having the introducing today as far as this new legislation, but we will be voting on the land use items that I'm discussing right now. We're going to be voting to approve LU 761 and 762, known as the Pfizer rezoning. I know that Council Member Levin has been working very hard over the last few months to reach an agreement with the developer on this application that would address some of the concerns that were raised at our hearing and have been voiced throughout the public review process. We're voting today with the agreement that the property will be developed in a manner that is as inclusive as possible. To this end, the developer has agreed to include for the affordable units, one, at least 30 percent will be one bedroom units, two, at least 30 percent will be two bedroom units, and to limit the development to a maximum of 20 percent of three bedroom units and a maximum of 20 percent of four bedroom units, so 60% of the units will be two bedrooms or below. This agreement, combined with existing zoning rules on the bedroom mix of MIH units, will ensure that we are serving the widest spectrum of housing need in both the community and across the city. This agreement will be memorialized in a restrictive declaration, which is similar to a deed restriction that has been executed and will be recorded on the property. The commissioner of HPD has also provided us a letter stating that the administration will monitor this project for compliance with the council agreement and restrictive declarations so that everybody can be sure that, in fact, this agreement will be adhered to. In addition to the restriction on the unit mix, the developers also agreed to convene an advisory panel that will give updates on the development, conduct a series of workshops open to local residents on the affordable housing application process, and establish goals for local hiring and MWBE contracting. While the public review process for this application has been contentious, I support approval understanding that we have made every effort to strike a compromise on this application to to ensure that the housing provided will address the broadest spectrum of housing needs. This development will produce close to 300 units of permanently affordable housing with no cost or funding to the taxpayer. It will be affordable for families with incomes ranging from 40 percent of AMI to 80 percent AMI, and it comes with a commitment from the administration to ensure ongoing monitoring of the safeguards the developer agree to. I want to thank Councilmember Levin for his willingness to listen and communicate with everyone from the supporters to the opponents of this project and for trying and successfully reaching a fair outcome. We'll also be voting to approve Tillery and Prince rezonings, LUs 766 and 767 in Councilmember Combo's district. This application would rezone a portion of a block at the intersection of Tillery and Prince Street from R6 to C6-4. A related zoning tax amendment would include the proposed project area within the special downtown Brooklyn district and Flappish Extension Height Limitation Area and establish a mandatory inclusion housing area, MIH Option 1. These actions would allow the development of two mixed-use buildings comprised of 262 apartments on a site currently occupied by a self-storage facility. We'll be voting to approve with modifications LUs 768 and 769, the Linden Boulevard rezoning at Councilmember Barron's district. Canyon Sterling Emerald LLC seeks the rezoning of Block 4496, bounded by Linden Boulevard, Emerald Street, Loring Avenue, and Amber Street, from an R4 to an R4C12, an R2R8A, C2-4, R7A, and R6A, and a related zoning tax amendment to establish a mandatory inclusionary housing area in order to facil facilitate the development of four new mixed-use affordable housing buildings ranging in height from 8 to 12 stories. Both MIH Option 1s and 2 were proposed. These applications will be modified to remove MIH Option 2, leaving the MIH option one, which will ensure that it is affordable to lower income. We will also be voting to approve the associated pre-considered LU, a tax exemption under Article 11 of the Private Housing Finance Law. These actions will facilitate the development of 514 affordable apartments. I know Councilmember Byron has worked very hard to ensure as much depth of affordability as possible. 
and I congratulate her on the outcome. We'll be voting to approve with modifications LU 770, the 661 8th Avenue signage text amendment in Councilmember Johnson's district. The text amendment will facilitate the installation of advertising signage on the roof of an existing two story retail building located at 661 8th Avenue in a C6 4 district within the 8th Avenue corridor of the theater subdistrict and perimeter area B of the Special Clinton district. This proposal would allow for the C6 7 signage rules to apply within the western portion of the 8th Avenue corridor of the theater subdistrict. The project site is located on the northwest corner of the intersection of 8th Avenue and 42nd Street and is the only corner map for the C6 4 district. The C6 7 signage rules allow advertising signage and generally allow signs with no signs or height restrictions. The text will be clarified to be consistent with the intent and the environmental review that it apply only to the corner lot portion of the zoning lot. We'll be voting to approve a pre-considered LU, the interior landmark designation of the New York Public Library, Stephen A. Schwartzman Building Interior, consisting of the main reading room, also known as the Rose Main Reading Room, and the catalog room, also known as the Bill Bass Public Catalog Room, third floor, and the fixtures and interior components of these spaces. The main reading room and catalog room located at 476 Fifth Avenue, Councilmember Garodnik's District, are masterpieces of Beaux Arts designs with 52-foot tall ceilings and round arched windows, making it the library's principal public spaces and primary designation for most visitors to the library. We're voting to approve LU-796, the Angela Court Tax Exemption, HPD seeks approval of an Article 11 tax exemption for a period of 40 years for a property located at 520 Manhattan Avenue in Councilmember Perkins District. The building's ownership will transition from Angela Associates LP to the Angela Court Association Housing Development Fund Corporation. The HDFC is expected to obtain approval of a cooperative offering plan and current residents will be offered the opportunity to purchase the shares of HDFC. A, real pay, a rehabilitation of this five-story building containing 23 occupied rental units will also be undertaken using HPD and HDC loans. Are there any members of the committee who have any questions or remarks that they'd like to make on this application? Council Member Levin. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to thank you uh, very much for <clears throat> allowing me to speak and for um, uh, your uh, guidance and even-handedness throughout this entire process. I want to acknowledge Subcommittee Chair Donovan Richards, uh, who uh, uh, was remarkably thorough, uh, conscientious, uh, even-handed as well in uh, weighing this application and all of uh, the uh, comments and voices and concerns that were raised in every, uh, from every quarter. So uh, thank you both uh, chairs. I'd also like to um, acknowledge uh, the land use staff, Brian Paul, Raju Mann, Dylan Casey, um, for their work on this, um, on this uh, application. Uh, I want to acknowledge um, the applicant, uh, Rabsky, um, and uh, their entire team uh, for being uh, very responsive whenever we had concerns that were raised uh, they were there to respond to them. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge Community Board 1, uh, which uh, uh, weighed this application, uh, voted in approval of this application. Uh, Borough President Eric Adams, who weighed this application as well, uh, did not approve this application but put forward recommendations, which were very helpful. And the City Planning Commission, the entire Department of City Planning, for their work as well. Um, I'd like to acknowledge also my staff, Edward Paulino and Jonathan Boucher, who spent many hours reviewing this application. Um, lastly, uh, and most importantly, I want to thank members of the public uh, who, uh, who voiced their support for this application and their opposition to this application. Uh, specifically, I want to acknowledge uh, United Jewish Organizations of Williamsburg, uh, as well as the Broadway Triangle Community Coalition. Uh, UJO who supported the application, Broadway Triangle Community Coalition who opposed the application, but everybody who uh, put forward passionate arguments, uh, arguments that, uh, that uh, came uh, from deep-seated beliefs, um, and we hope that the process has worked here and that uh, any concerns that were raised were uh, acceptably addressed um, in uh, the manner th to the greatest extent uh, possible and that the issues that were raised by supporters of this application uh, were also addressed, which is namely the deep need for affordable housing in all of our communities, uh, not one community or the other, all communities um, that are in uh, North Brooklyn. Uh, indeed across the city, but this application was in North Brooklyn, and so uh, we, we specifically uh, want to address those deep needs of affordable housing. Um, as the chair said, uh, this application involves the rezoning of blocks 2249 and 2265 
uh, from an M31 to an R8A, R7D, R7A with a C24 overlay and accompanying zoning text amendments to establish an MIH, mandatory inclusionary housing area. The MIH project will be uh, MIH option number one, which achieves the deepest level of affordability, 25% of the residential floor area going to create 287 units of affordable housing at an average of 60% AMI or below, with 10% of the, of the units, which is 115 units, required at 40% of AMI. The project will also create 404 parking spaces, 64,000 square feet of local retail space, and 26,000 square feet of publicly accessible open space. Um, now with regard to uh, uh, commitments made by uh, this developer, um, we, uh, they willingly and we required uh, that there be a restrictive declaration, or we didn't require, but we worked with the, uh, with the declarant to, uh, to achieve a restrictive declaration. Uh, and they willingly did that. That uh, is uh, seven or eight pages long. I won't uh, uh, bore everybody with the, the details of it. We did read it into the record, or a good portion of it into the record at the subcommittee. But uh, the most important part of it is uh, that it is binding upon not only this applicant, but any successor on the land. And that in section 3.01 establishes that Anybody that lives within a half mile, either as an owner or a tenant, has the opportunity uh, to enforce this restrictive declaration. This is de that's in 3.01. Declarant acknowledges that the restrictions, covenants, and obligations of this declaration will protect the value and desirability of the subject property, as well as the benefit of the city, including all landowners and tenants, including the city of New York, owning or leasing property, within one half mile of the subject property. And then skipping ahead to 3.09, the declaration may be amended, modified, or canceled only with the approval of the Speaker of the City Council. No other approval or consent shall be required from any other public entity, private person, or legal entity of any kind. This declaration, which is going to be recorded against the deed, can only be modified by the Speaker of the City Council and can be enforced by any member of, uh, who lives, of the public who lives or owns property within a half mile of the site. Um, this is uh, in excess of anything that we've required of any other private application uh, that, we, that in my experience that we've uh, had before us at the, at the Land Use Committee. Um, and I am satisfied uh, that it is as legally strong as any uh, uh, requirement that we have seen in my almost eight years here at this council. Um, in addition, HBD has, uh, has acknowledged that they will be monitoring um, the agreements between the council and uh, the applicant and reporting out to not only the council, but members of the public, the community board, um, when their MIH application is submitted uh, as per the regulatory agreement. Lastly, um, I want to acknowledge that the Affordable housing lottery is going to be administered by uh, an impartial agency um, that whose entire goal is to uh, ensure that the lottery is administered fairly and that, um, and that, uh, uh, th that applications are coming from far and wide, that outreach is equitable across all communities, and that we receive uh, the maximum number of applications uh, and that is possible, and that the maximum number of applications that are able to be qualified uh, be so. So, uh, Mr. Chair, I want to thank you very much for your time. My colleagues, I want to thank you all for your time. Um, we appreciate very much all of the consideration given to this application. Um, I encourage you all to vote in the affirmative. Um, I believe strongly that this is a project worthy of a yes vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Levin. Congratulations. Any other of my colleagues have any other comments or questions? Councilman Brinoso. Thank you, Chair. Uh, the Broadway Triangle neighborhood is at the intersection of three historic communities, the predominantly Latino community of Bushwick and Williamsburg in the south side, the Hasidic community in South Williamsburg, and the largely African-American community of Bedford-Stuyvesant. It, it also represents one of the most underbuilt areas in the borough providing massive potential for the development of affordable housing 
which is desperately needed in the surrounding communities. In 2009, the Bloomberg administration rezoned the adjacent blocks of the Broadway Triangle, including both private and city-owned sites from manufacturing to residential. The city's plan developed with United Jewish Organizations and the Richard Bushwick Senior Citizens Council with no public bidding process, favored the construction of low-rise buildings with large unit sizes. This meant that the number of affordable housing units was not maximized, and the planned units were designed to favor those uh, with large family sizes, meaning the Hasidic community primarily found in the nearby South Williamsburg. The coalition of churches, nonprofits, and tenant associations representing the surrounding communities of color in Williamsburg, Bushwick, and bed successfully sued the city over this plan for violating fair housing regulations. The judge found that the city's plan, quote, would not only not foster integration of the neighborhood, but would perpetuate segregation in the Broadway Triangle, quote, unquote. In the course of this lawsuit, Pernama Kapoor, then the head of the Brooklyn Office of Department of City Planning, testified on the record that while developing zoning plans, the Department of City Planning does not consider the possibility of racial segregation and does not evaluate whether segregation took place after a, rezo uh, a zoning is implemented. It falls to us here in the City Council to ensure that discriminatory housing doesn't happen here. Despite ongoing negotiations with the city, the lawsuit still has not been settled. The court issued an injunction on development of the two city-owned sites, yet development of the privately-owned sites continue unabated despite the fact that our community has long been advocating that any settlement of the lawsuit include a commitment from the city to create a truly inclusive, community-based plan for the entire Broadway Triangle area. Instead, the city is allowing the development to move forward with no meaningful public input. Additionally, it is worth noting that the member deference policy for approval of rezoning has had a devastating effect on North Brooklyn's Latino community already. During the 2005 rezoning of the Williamsburg waterfront, then Council Member Diana Reyna did not have the opportunity for meaningful input, despite the fact that she represented an impacted community. Yet the council passed it because of support by Councilmember David Yasky, who was at that time representing the neighborhood now represented by Councilmember Levin in the Broadway Triangle. Since then, the Hispanic population of Williamsburg has decreased by more than 25%. In August of 2014, the Rapsky Group purchased part of the rezoned Rango site of the Reed for, from Reed Group. Rapsky being the applicant that is currently vying for a rezoning here in the Pfizer site. To date, the Rapsky Group has followed through on none of the commitments agreed to the co with the community. The integrity of the council is in que gets questioned if a developer is allowed to continue to develop in other areas when they haven't met the commitments of a community in prior, in prior rezonings. Uh, at this point, the Broadway Triangle will end up being over 90% white uh, in 10 years. Uh, we won a lawsuit four years ago. We're gonna win one in the next four years and we'll continue to sue as a community. And I won't stand for segregation in and around my community and look to the city to implement more integration in a lot of these rezonings, not segregation. Thank you for your time, Chair. Thank you. Are there any other council members who have any other comments they'd like to make on any of the items that we are voting on today? Hearing none, I will ask the clerk to call the roll and to start with those council members who need to return to other hearings. Committee Clerk Matthew DiStefano, Committee on Land Use. Roll call on today's calendared land use items, which are coupled for a vote. Council Member Koo. Rodriguez. Gentilly. No, I, I, Council Member Coop. I, I, I apologize. I just want to, before we go back, I just want to clarify once again because we're having multiple hearings today. We are now going to move on to a vote in accordance with the recommendations of the subcommittees and with the support of the local council members to approve LU 761, 762, 766, 767, preconsidered LU, the New York Public Library, Interior's Landmark 796 and preconsiders LU the Linden Boulevard tax exemption and to approve with modifications that I have described, LUs 768, 769, and 770. I want to just make sure that we don't have any confusion because we're hearing a lot of items today. I'll ask the clerk to recall the roll. Thank you. Council Member Koo. I will aye. Council Member Rodriguez. Council Member Gentili. 
Vote aye. Palma. Garodnik. Aye. Mealy. Lander. Request permission to explain my vote. Councilmember Lander to explain his vote. Thank you, Chair Greenfield. First, I'd like to say I'd like to sign on to intros 1685 and 1661 as a co-sponsor, despite my anxiety shared with Councilmember Espinal that uh, urban agriculture could further promote gentrification. No, no. <laughs> um, um, I grappled with uh, Pfizer sites rezoning. Um, I am supporting it today, but I really respect the points of view on all sides. The combination of historic segregation plus gentrification is a very deeply challenging and undermining combination for communities uh, like those in these neighborhoods, and so I really appreciate the advocacy that folks here have done. I do believe in the context of a privately owned site that it is much better to have MIH and some affordable units than no affordable units, which is what we have previously had, and I respect the work Councilmember Levin has done to make sure it is as fair as it can be. Uh, but I really do respect the work of Councilmember Reynoso and the others uh, in the room. I vote aye on all. Thank you. Levin. Permission to explain my vote. Councilmember Levin to explain his vote. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Actually, I, I just wanted to, uh, I was remiss in, in, uh, in not acknowledging my colleague Antonio Reynoso and, and, and the work that he has done on this uh, application as well. And so I, I do want to acknowledge uh, the uh, tremendous amount of work that he also put into this. And with that, I vote aye. Councilmember Rodriguez. My vote. Councilmember Rodriguez to explain his vote. It, and a hundred percent with the sentiments and the call of my colleague, Councilmember Reynoso, I believe that we have to look at the rezoning process as something that it provides us the opportunity to build affordable housing without non particular group being pushed out. We have seen gentrification happening all over the place. Uh, I represent Northern Manhattan. They are in Northern Manhattan and had to stand up and vote against a project that the mayor wanted to see happen, the Broadway Sherman rezoning. And the reason why I did not support it was because it was not, a, it was not what my community wanted at that particular moment. Saying that I truly believe that we had to build a New York City for all. And we had to learn from all experiences. You know, we are a city of immigrants. We are a city of opportunity. We are a city where everyone should have the opportunity to stay in this community. I understand Councilmember Reynoso District. As someone born and raised in the Dominican community, I can tell you that I have seen many of my fellow brothers and sisters who they used to live in that area 50, 40 years ago, disappearing from that area. Uh, we are a city where we welcome individuals, also, the newcomer, as we were welcomed 50 years ago or 400, 400 years ago when in 1613 we got the first non-Native American who came from La Hispaniola, Juan Rodriguez, to New York City. In this particular project, I will be voting in favor, understanding that everything that Council Member Reynoso is calling for is something that it's important to be taken into consideration. I'm voting yes because also, and when I was, my district is a bro used to be shared in the Broadway by, Broadway by Council Member Jackson and myself. And since we as a council have established a cultural and, and policy where we support the decision of the council member represent, and I believe may say, and that's the reason why I'm voting in favor of this project by understanding that Council Member Reynoso is calling for a lot of things that is very important in order to make rezoning without pushing any particular group out of their community. With that, I vote aye. Rose. Aye. Williams. Richards. I vote aye, and I, uh, I think one thing uh, Councilmember Levin neglected to mention was also there will be an advisory board set up through this process, so I'm hoping that all the different parties uh, who are pro and, and con on this project really can come together and figure out a framework that will ensure that this project is the best project for the community. I wholeheartedly 
uh, agree with Councilmember Levin. There's past histories that are going to be very hard to overcome. There's a past history. But I think moving forward, if we can collectively come together and have an honest dialogue, but also a dialogue that uh, collectively is, can be useful through this process, uh, this project will turn out good. This is a lottery process once again. So for all of those who are saying that this particular project is segmented to one community, it is going to be the onus is also on you to ensure that we are doing the outreach in all communities uh, with the particular organizations to ensure everybody has an opportunity to uh, apply to this project. So there's no development in this city that we pass, I think, through the subcommittee and through the land use uh, process uh, committee as well. That is perfect. There is no developer perfect. There is no one perfect. But if we all work through this process collectively and push to make sure that the things that were committed actually do happen, this will be a different project. So I uh, want to thank Councilmember Levin for his thoughtfulness, and he's always been someone of character. I, I don't, you know, we see a lot of members, we see a lot of land use items, but this is a man of character, and, and I'm certainly uh, going to support this project. So I vote aye. Thank you. Cohen. Uh, I am abstaining on 678 and 679, and I vote aye on all other items on the calendar. Reynoso. I vote aye on all with the exception of land use numbers 761 and 762. In which Torres. I vote no. Torres. Uh, permission to explain my vote? Uh, I will vote aye, um, as I did in the previous subcommittee, but with some trepidation. I mean, I do acknowledge that Councilmember Levin has made good faith attempts at addressing the fair housing concerns. Whether those attempts will succeed or unfold as we hope, we don't know for sure, right? The practice of enforcing voluntary or restrictive decks is uncharted territory for the city council. So there is something of a, a gamble here, but I did believe you did the best you could within the constraints of your role as a city council member. But the truth is, we would not be having a conversation about fair housing if it were not for Councilmember Reynoso. And it's too often that we make decisions about zoning, whether it be in the domain of education or housing, while giving too little consideration to fair housing, giving too little consideration to the impact that those public policy choices have in entrenching patterns of income and race segregation in our city. I believe that race segregation is a rot at the very core of our city. And as long as we remain segregated and as long as we remain indifferent to it, uh, we will never be the fair and equal society that we claim to be. But with that said, I vote aye. Councilmember Cohen. I just, to be clear, I Can you just speak into the mic, Councilmember Rosari? Thank you very much. Sorry. I'm abstaining on item 768 and 769 and voting aye on all other items on the calendar. Councilmember Traeger. Vote aye. Grodenchik. Aye. Salamanca. Aye on all. Mealy. May I explain my vote? Sure, Councilmember Mealy, to explain her vote. I want to thank um, Stephen Levin for advocating for this, but I hope this Savaji board really pay close attention to the diversity of these housing. Um, I know it will be a lottery, but diversity is desperately needed in that development. Um, I read how um, the apartments, how big the apartments are, so I know the lottery will favor some more than others, but I hope that Avaji Board will stay alert and stay on top of to make sure it really is a diverse building in that neighborhood. And on that, I vote aye on all. Thank you. Williams. Councilmember Williams to explain his vote. Thank you very much. 
uh, reiterating and adding to some of the comments I made uh, at the subcommittee. One, I think uh, two communities here are being forced to fight over uh, the leftovers of a pie instead of getting uh, the majority of the pie. That's the most unfortunate thing here that's happening across the city. I do believe that um, we, we have to acknowledge that the racism and anti-Semitism uh, was abound in these conversations and, and there's a history of that for various reasons. I do want to mention uh, the Daily News who tried to pretend that this was all about anti-Semitism. I think that that was completely false. They also made light of the community's gripe uh, that this would exclude black and Latino families because it is open to all comers uh, by the lottery and prioritizes anyone living in Williamsburg and Greenpoint. Uh, that uh, does not acknowledge the fact that this is a minimal amount of units here that will probably go to black and Latino communities. Also doesn't acknowledge uh, the poverty and salary issues that come with trying to get one of the uh, market rate apartments. And that argument seems to align itself more with uh, our illustrious HUD Secretary, Bed Carson, who said uh, poverty is a choice. So I just want to admonish the Daily News to really pay attention uh, to what the issues are here. Both of these communities and all communities need uh, public housing. I'm sorry, but they need public housing. They also need affordable income targeted housing, both in the Hasidic community, of course, in the black and Latino community. Uh, and that is not enough to go around, which is why everyone's fighting for crumbs. I do believe historically the black and Latino community has gotten the butt end of this uh, conversation, and therefore that needs to be addressed. I believe we are here because the body itself has avoided, to ha avoided having very important but complex, nuanced, and often controversial conversations. I also believe that we have failed on MIH. I'm thankful that the administration is now uh, trying to improve on that with some of the term sheets, but it could have been addressed earlier. Some of the issues that we have not talked about, one of which is member deference, which is very, very important to this body. I do not want to see go away because uh, we know our districts better than anyone else. There are times, however, when member deference runs afoul of what this body says it wants to accomplish. I'm saying this as a person who is running to lead this body, and I know how difficult this conversation is and how it looks, but it is not something that we can run away from. That is what is most important. We have to figure out how to honor member deference, which is very important, while moving forward together uh, with what we say uh, in the public and in press conferences is what this body wants to see. Uh, the other is we've often not had conversations about how we can force uh, developers to do what it is we want them to do uh, beyond community benefits agreements, beyond advisory boards. We're often told there isn't much, and we've learned thanks to uh, the work of both uh, Council Member Levin and Reynoso that there is more that we can do. Uh, we have a, a restrictive declaration that is on here. We, we know that we can do even harsher uh, deed restrictions, and we haven't. We, a body, have to explore that more. I voted no uh, in the subcommittee, and I'm going to vote no again on uh, the Pfizer site in this uh, broader committee. But I, I want to make mention I am still continuing to research one particular thing. I voted, uh, and I generally vote and try to be consistent, and I vote based on what I believe this body has the power to do and either did and don't do. And so far, uh, and I want to confirm that before the state, it, it does look like Council Member Levin did everything in his power and this body's power to do based on the issues that were brought to me and I asked to be resolved, which was primarily around codifying, uh, really codifying what the unit breakdowns would be. And it seems to me that the mayor and the administration refused to allow him to go further. And if that is actually the case, I'm not sure that I can hold Councilman Levin responsible for that. While at the same time, we have to acknowledge, we cannot disagree, that when this project is finished, it will have nothing, it would have done nothing to address segregation in the city. And in fact, 80 to 90 percent of those units will not go to black and Latino families who have, <laughs> who have, uh, as I mentioned earlier, received the butt end of many of these affordable income targeted units, while acknowledging that all communities, including the Hasidic community, 
have a need for this. So with that, I'm going to vote no on land use 761-762, and I and all the rest. Thank you. Council Member Kalos. Permission to explain my vote? Council Member Kalos to explain his vote. I uh, reached out to city planning with concerns about this. I still wait to hear back from city planning. I have serious, unbridled concerns about city planning's weight for communities and their concerns versus those of developers in spot zoning and uh, those need to be addressed as these types of zonings continue to occur. Uh, that being said, the body has a long-standing practice of deference to the local member, and so I do support uh, my colleague and hear very loudly the concerns of uh, my colleagues led by the neighboring council member, Antonio Reynoso. Uh, and I hope to have these concerns addressed. I vote aye. Chair Greenfield. Thank you very much. Uh, I wanted to give my colleagues the opportunity to speak before I concluded the vote and my thoughts on this project as well. I want to welcome, uh, there seems to be a baby in the room, so let the record reflect that we are very baby friendly here in the New York City Council and we thank you for attending with your child and you can look back one day and point to this video as proof that your child got an early education in civics. So I've, 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 I hear, I certainly have heard the concerns and the, the strong feelings on all sides, and I very much respect the advocacy that we've seen among some of the activists, and I'm going to talk about just what that means in a moment. I think that if, if we look over the past couple of years, we've seen, since we've enacted mandatory inclusionary housing, and uh, for the record, uh, I think Councilman Williams, you, you, you stated that you were running to lead this body. I'm not sure that we allow politicking uh, at our open committee hearings, but for the record, I'm not running to lead the body. Okay, okay, I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. Uh, everybody, every, every council member has the same opportunity to lobby for themselves to be the next leader of this body. And so, and so I think what we've seen is just, it's important to note as well that we've seen several applications that have totaled several hundred units of affordable housing that have been defeated in many cases because of concerns about neighborhood change. And, in some cases, I've agreed with those decisions. In other cases, I've disagreed. But certainly, we have followed the general consensus, which is that if a council member has a legitimate land use objection to an item, that we will support the council member's objections. And that's what we've done. And I hope that's what we'll continue to do. I do think, however, that in, in some cases, I'm going to take a short break to allow those folks who would like to leave. We'll give them the opportunity to leave. Once people, once people found out that I wasn't running for speaker, they decided it wasn't that exciting to hear me out anymore. I hear that. I certainly respect that perspective. I want to thank you, folks, those who have attended and those who continue to attend. And I always state that these remarks are not just for the people in the room, but it's also for those folks who late at night, and believe me, there are at least 11 people late at night who watch this when they can't fall asleep, many of whom text me the next morning and saying thank you for keeping me entertained and informed. The point that I was trying to make is that, that there are every, in the four years since I've become chair of the Land Use Committee, we've seen a lot more contentiousness around the land use process. And in many ways, that's a good thing, because we've also seen more participation, I think, than ever before in the land use process. And we've also seen the building of more affordable housing than certainly in my modern recollection in this city as well. And so I certainly think that it's a welcome, it's welcome that we have so many folks who are involved and are active in the process. I think the, the, the challenge is that at least from my perspective, there needs to be a line drawn from being an advocate for yourself and community 
versus opposing any other ethnic community. And that's really what I'd like to speak about here today. And obviously, I have, I have been the un, unwitting center of some of this. Councilmember Williams referred to a editorial in the Daily News this morning that I was referenced as well. And I think that it is certainly legitimate for individuals to engage in civic disobedience and to object and to, uh, be, to be vocal about their opposition to a process. And I believe genuinely that many of the people who have objected to this particular project, the controversial one that I'm referring to today, which is the Pfizer project, have done so out of a place where they genuinely believe that this is a bad project and they'd like to stop their project, stop the project, or alternatively, they're genuinely advocating for their communities. And I respect that and, in fact, admire that very much as someone who's an elected official who used to be an activist as well. I think the problem becomes when we cross from advocating for one community versus advocating against another community. And I think that's the problem that we've seen that have had, has happened over here with some, and to be clear, not all, because I don't believe this is the sentiment of all the activists, but some of the activists. And so I think it's important just to, to, sort, of, just to sort of rewind a second and to give some perspective in the culmination of what happened over here in the last few weeks. This summer, at a public community board meeting, a community board member testified to the City Planning Commission that the Jewish developer was, quote, like a cancer, and that cancer spreads, and he, referring to the Jewish developer, was going to spread the cancer around. We, earlier, earlier at this hearing, one of the individuals who very conveniently just left a few moments ago, an attorney and a leader of the self-proclaimed coalition that is trying to stop the Pfizer development, publicly testified that to this committee, right over here, that in fact that the reason that the Pfizer development had support was because there was a secret Jewish money connection between the applicant and a prominent rabbi who supports the application, both of whom happened to be Hasidic Jews. After the rabbi testified this was an outrageous lie, the same attorney then testified that it was only an allegation. Then he followed up under questioning that it was simply idle speculation. And then he admitted under questioning that it was rumor, mark, rumor monging, essentially at the expense of the rabbi's reputation and the Hasidic community. These exploits have been written upon by the New York Post, Crane's New York Business, and now the New York Daily News. And I want to repeat the point. It's commendable when organizations stand up for their respective communities. Our diversity is what makes this city so great. However, it is shameful when some individuals who oppose a project seek to do so and try to do so out of open hatred for another ethnic group. And I say this as somebody who actually has a different perspective because I have the perspective of someone who is leaving. This is a very dangerous road. We've never done this before in this committee. We've had a lot of passion. And we've had people glue themselves together. And we've had people get arrested. We've had people yell and scream, all of which is fear. We've never gone down the road where one New York ethnic community turns on another New York ethnic community and says, it's not just because we want to protect our own community, it's because we don't like you, the other community. That's really unacceptable, and we need to move away from that. And to be clear, the folks who are making those arguments Essentially, what they're actually saying is that they'd like to deny people housing based on their religion, which is an obvious violation of the Federal Fair Housing Act, which those folks are claiming to uphold. So we have to be fair and objective across the board. And it's been very difficult for me to recommend to vote against a project that would create affordable housing that we so badly need. And we've done it on occasion, but I'm very proud today that we're voting in favor of nearly 300 new affordable housing pro 300 new affordable housing apartments that will rise on this site. I'm proud of the fact that we have a compromise. We could have just as easily, for the opponents, we could have ignored everyone. That's not what we did. We did what we always do. We sat down and we heard the legitimate complaints. And folks said, hey, we want to make sure, in fact, that these affordable units are open to everyone. We did something that was unprecedented. We put the equivalent of a deed restriction on the property so that we would ensure that there would be affordable units for everyone. To Chair Richard's point, we put an agreement that there would be active education and workshops to make sure that everybody would have access to the affordable apartments. And obviously, the fair housing laws would apply as well to ensure that everyone, regardless of their race, religion, or color, would have access to the affordable housing. And so 
I want to congratulate my colleague, Councilmember Levin, for his courage in the face of criticism. I want to thank those who have come here in good faith to testify, and I assure you that we've heard you. I want to tell those who tried to slip out before they could hear legitimate criticism of them that they engaged in bad faith and they should not continue this because the reason that there is such outrage and the reason that whether it is a right-wing publication or a left-wing publication or a centrist publication that everyone has spoken out is because every objective person recognizes that this is not the road that we want to go on in New York City. We have the most diverse city in the country. We're very proud of that. We should work together. We should agree when we agree. We should disagree when we disagree, but we should do so respectfully. And so despite the threats and the intimidation and in some cases anti-Semitism, I'm very proud to vote in favor of this. I'm proud to vote in favor of all the items today. I will, however, there is a project in Councilmember Johnson's district, which is LU770, and I'm going to abstain from that project. And I believe we have one other council member who'd like to vote, and we'd like to turn it over to Councilmember Mendez for her vote. Councilmember Mendez. Thank you, Chair Greenfield. I just want to take a moment to say uh, ditto to all of your remarks, and um, I'll be voting aye on all, but voting no on LU numbers 761 and 762. Uh, back in 2009, I voted no on the Broadway Triangle, and I spoke to my colleague Steve Levin this morning, and I think um, there are some better things uh, in this deal, but I think uh, we need to look back to what has happened in this community, a community that I was born and raised in. And for those reasons, I cannot vote for this, uh, but I really think that the personal attacks have been um, really horrible and people should refrain from them. And it's been personally hurtful to me to walk by this building and see some of the banners being held up against my colleagues. So even though I had nothing to do with that, I want to apologize because that was my community, and I still have a lot of family members there, and you do not deserve that. So uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for allowing me to explain my vote, and thank you, colleagues. Councilmember Barron. Thank you. Request permission to explain my vote. Councilmember Barron to explain her vote. Thank you. Uh, I want to thank the chair for allowing me to explain my vote. There's a project on the calendar, which is in my district, and I just want to share with those of you who are here uh, why I think this project is an e exemplary model for what it is that we talk about when we need rezoning. We know that we have a homeless crisis here in the city, and I think unless the city takes steps to include in its projects an opportunity for those who are homeless to be able to apply, we're not going to solve the problem. So the Linden rezoning problem, the re Linden rezoning project in my district is going to be 500 units, and there'll be 10% set aside for the homeless. There'll be 10% set aside for people who make $23,000, 10% set aside for people who make $32,000, and I like the dollars rather than the AMI percents because people don't know what the AMI percents are. I like the 10% for people who are making 32,000, 10% for people who are making um, 40,000, and 10% for people who are making $49,000. And another 25% for people who are up to the $69,000 range. And the reason that's important is because in my community, the neighborhood median income is only $34,000. So if I'm approving projects coming into my community that don't address where the majority of my community is, I'm doing particularly my community a disservice. So I'm very pleased to say that this is a great project. It will have twice as much parking available than what the city is requiring under this rezoning. It will have um, an opportunity for local hires. It will be a combination of union and non-union labor, and it will have an MWBE goal of 40%. So I'm very, and 40% of the units that are part of the project are affordable into perpetuity. 
And I think that this is a model for what we should be doing when we talk about a housing crisis, homelessness, people who are rent burdened, to provide them with an opportunity to take uh, advantage of that. So uh, I vote in favor of that project and the others with the exception of my colleague is sitting right here next to me, 759 and 760 and 761 and 762. And the reason that I'm opposed to those is because I don't believe that the destruction of woodland with the promise of replacing trees that will take decades to mature is an appropriate way to address uh, the climate control, the climate change that we're facing and I don't think that uh, the wetlands will be able to absorb all the storms that may be coming, and the reason, and the area that that, uh, the reason that that area was not as severely impacted during Superstorm Sandy is because they had the wetlands and the woodlands. So um, opposing that, and as well as seven six one and seven six two. Thank you so much. Thank you, Councilmember Barron. Congratulations on the deal that you reached in the project in your district. I'll now ask the clerk to call the final roll, and then we'll move on to the public hearing for the three pieces of legislation that we're hearing today. Today's land use vote, uh, the following were approved by a vote of 21 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, no abstentions. LU numbers 766, 767, 796, the preconsidered LU in regard to Linden Boulevard, the preconsidered LU in regard to the New York Public Library. Uh, LU's numbers 761 and 762 were approved by the vote of 17 in the affirmative, 4 in the negative, and no abstentions. LU numbers 768, 769, and 770 were approved with modifications with a vote of 20 in the affirmative, 0 negative, and 1 abstention. Thank you. Congratulations. All land use items have been adopted and passed. The are now officially are closing the vote on those items, and we are moving on to the public hearing on the three pieces of legislation. We're going to start first with Councilmember Chin's legislation, intro number 1685. We will, however, invite the administration to testify for the sake of brevity on all of these items at once, and then we will open it up to the public on the individual items. So we invite the folks who are here from the administration to please join us at the witness table. And once they are settled, we will begin the second portion of the hearing, which is the hearing on three proposed pieces of legislation. Okay. Been joined by Barry Dinnerstein from the Department of City Planning. Barry, can you just wave? Thank you very much. Molly Hartman, Senior Advisor to the Office of Food Policy. Molly, you just thank you very much. Anita Lermont, who is the Council for the Department of City Planning. Thank you, Anita. And Eric Batsford, the Manhattan Borough Deputy Director from the Department of City Planning as well. Uh, folks uh, in the City Council, before we have folks from the administration who uh, testify, uh, we would ask that you please raise your right hand. Do you uh, affirm that everything that you are about to testify today and the response to all your questions will be the truth to the best of your knowledge? Thank you very much. With that, uh, I invite you in whatever order you see fit to open your remarks. Councilmember Chin, would you actually like to make some opening remarks now or would you like to do so after the uh, first panel? You want to do so now. So why don't we, if you don't mind, I apologize. We're going to allow Margaret Chin, the council member who has sponsored this piece of one of the pieces of legislation, the one that we will open to public testimony right after the panel, which is Introduction 1685. Council Member Chin, please, whenever you're ready, make your opening remarks. Thank you, Chair Greenfield, and thank you to the member of the Land Use Committee for holding this important hearing on my legislation, Intro Number 1685. The legislation makes it possible for application filed by uh, certain public 
uh, officials, especially uh, authorized to file land use application, to be exempt from the Department of City Planning's pre-application process, which can add nearly a year to the filing of a land use application or even delay a filing indefinitely. Right now, vulnerable communities across the city are currently under threat by overdevelopment. By streamlining the process, this legislation can encourage strong partnership between communities and their elected officials in their effort to protect against overdevelopment and preserve the characters of their neighborhoods. This legislation will help make it easier to control the context um, and the proliferation of out-of-scale luxury development uh, in the Two Bridges Waterfront area in my district and also on the Upper East Side and the rest of the city. I look forward to working with my colleagues to secure the ability to fast-track truly community-based complete application to allow for the immediate filing of application and a timely start of the EULA process. By streamlining this pre-application process, public officials can better work with their communities to forge a pathway to help shape the futures of neighborhoods and help create a better city for the communities who help build it. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much. And just uh, to remind the folks who are just tuning in, the panel has already affirmed that they will testify truthfully, which we know they will because they're all fine people on this panel. So, Councillor, whenever you're ready. Sorry, sorry now. Good morning, Chair Greenfield and distinguished members of the Land Use Committee. Thank you very much for the opportunity to be here today to discuss proposed intro 1685 regarding application requirements for zoning text amendments. I'm joined here by my colleagues, Eric Botsford, Bob Tuttle, and Barry Dinnerstein from City Planning, and Molly Hartman from the Mayor's Office of Food Policy to answer questions on this and the other two proposals. Intro 1685, sponsored by Council Members Chin and Gentilly, is a proposed local law to amend the administrative code of the City of New York in relation to exempting certain government entities applications for zoning text amendments from city planning's pre-application rules. The Department of City Planning does not support exempting such applications from these requirements. The department believes that its pre-application requirements add value to the overall process and outcome on all sides, ultimately leading to a more efficient and quicker review. In order to give greater insight to the committee on why we hold this view, I would like to explain the rationale for the application process and then give an overview of that process as administered by city planning. The department developed its application process called Blueprint in 2012 to create predictability. Prior to the existence of Blueprint, there was no defined procedure to guide the application process and no procedures governing the sequencing of the preparation of application materials. This generally resulted in protracted, indeterminate pre-application periods. In contrast, the blueprint process established measurable timeframes for the review of land use applications and allows the quick identification and resolution of issues encountered as applications proceed on the critical path to certification. This carefully conceived process, which was constructed with extensive stakeholder input, created clear benchmarks for moving a proposal forward, including specified review and response timeframes on DCP's part. The sequential steps also facilitate the organization of the information and material necessary to prepare complete and accurate land use applications and related environmental review documents for consideration by the City Planning Commission and other stakeholders, all to ensure that applications are sufficiently comprehensive, clear and complete before an application is certified or referred for public review. The application process always begins with a conversation and not a filing. Applicants meet with DCP planners for an informational meeting to discuss the scope of their proposal. The goal of this meeting is to gather key basic information about the proposal so that city planning can advise the applicant on the type of land use application and the level of environmental analysis that will be necessary as part of the review. If the applicant chooses to proceed, that meeting is followed by the applicant filing a pre-application statement which provides basic pertinent information about the proposal to formally begin the pre-certification process. 
The pre-certification, uh, the pre-application statement, or PAS, requests basic pertinent information about a proposed project. The PAS serves multiple goals. It helps DCP advise applicants early in the process on what may be needed to advance their proposal. The PAS is not designed to assess the merits of a proposal, but rather the PAS allows DCP to assign appropriate staff at the beginning of the review process and coordinate review across multiple div divisions. It provides a formal starting point for the application review process and allows city planning to start tracking progress of a proposal in a fair and consistent manner. Over a dozen types of land use applications do not require a PAS. These application types that require little or no environmental review and interdepartmental coordination include office space leases by the city, enclosed sidewalk cafes, and landmarks and historic district designations. The next step is an interdivisional meeting, which is an opportunity for applicants to present a proposal to the relevant city planning staff from the various divisions that will be responsible for reviewing the application materials. Following the interdivisional meeting, city planning will provide applicants with clear written guidance on the land use and environmental applications. The, the applicant can then develop a reasonable worst case development scenario memo, which sets forth the analysis framework for the environmental review. All of this occurs before an applica applicant submits a draft land use application and a draft environmental analysis so that applicants do not put work into these highly technical documents without guidance from the department professionals that will be reviewing those materials for completeness. These required steps add value to the process and better allocate department resources to help achieve these ends. The process avoids rework loops in connection with both the land use application and environmental review, allowing for the correction of omissions, inconsistencies, and errors, which might be identified too late in the process to easily correct without undue delay. I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify on this matter and look forward to hearing from the council on its ideas to achieve the shared goal of a more efficient application process. Should we? go on with our testimony and other two or thank you if you don't mind actually we we'd like just for the sake of clarity for those watching at home for the council members to be able to ask questions first and That's then fine. you can absolutely we'll let you then move on on the other items as well I'm going to turn it over to councilmember Chen I just have one quick question for you uh, regarding the pre-application uh, process and I do want to thank you and your staff you've always been very welcoming of our new ideas, even if you don't always agree with them. <laughs> and so we appreciate the opportunity to at least have those honest discussions. Uh, since 2013, has CPC ever allowed EDC or any other mayoral agency to file an application without first completing the Department of City Planning's pre-application process? I am, I am not aware that that has been the case. Okay. I'm not aware of that. Would you mind just Absolute checking check. that Absolute. out for us and just letting us know okay. as a, as a follow-up, because that would be helpful for us to know. Thank you. With that, I will turn it over to Councilmember Chin for further questions on her legislation. Thank you, Chair. Um, you know, from your testimony, what is the hesitation? I mean, I'm talking about um, public official like the mayor, mayoral agency, borough president, and the Land Use Committee of the City Council upon a two-third vote of its member. So it's not just individual council member just rushing in uh, with their commu you know, committee, communities. Um, it's going to be uh, a thought-out process. And all these uh, public officials, they also have the resources to put forth the application. Um, so it's, not, it's something that is well thought out um, and is needed. Right? That, that is so it's not just anybody just coming up with something and just rushing. So I, I, w I would say that our hesitation is that we very firmly believe that there is value to the full pre-application process that is laid out in Blueprint. Uh, but you have I also, you, DCP can also use that um, and hold up an application indefinitely. I mean, it could drag on to a year or more, or I mean, uh, that is, you know, that is the issue here. How do we get a speedy review, uh, especially, for example, what is happening in my district where we cannot get DCP 
to really look at the, you know, what is at stake in the community when we have two mega project coming in and DCP still look at it as minor modification, um, something needs to be done to protect the community um, and to really allow the community and the elected official that represent the community have a full review and involvement in the process. With or without blueprint, the staff is discharging its responsibility to ensure that applications are complete. And as I said in my testimony, the blueprint process was, this pre-application process was designed to have a framework under which that review was done. Prior to the existence of blueprint, which is in, in essence sort of what would be the case for these applications, there was no structure around the process of getting to the commission. And so in that period, applications took a very long time. I would submit to you that we believe very firmly that the blueprint process has made clearer, fairer, and more predictable how one gets from the concept of an application to the commission. And I, I don't think that we use blueprint in a uh, way to prevent things from proceeding. In fact, we have indicated in this administration, and we have acted on that indication, that we are prepar prepared to certify as complete applications that the department firmly disagrees with. And we have done that in this administration. Previously, if the, if the department did not agree with an application, it could drag out the process of review. And this predictable framework doesn't allow for that because there are set time frames in which we must act. To me, it's still a bureaucratic process and you can use it when you want it. Um, but when a community is under attack, we have to find every way possible, every tool possible to protect our community. And this way, we will be able to fast track the process because the developer is already there, right? And they have the resources to move forward as quickly as possible. And we just want to have a fair chance on our side. Council, Council Member Chin, I, I will point out to you that we have already scheduled a meeting with your team to talk about the application that you are proposing. And, and we are committed, as we always are, to working with elected officials to advance proposals that they have. And we will do that regardless of whether or not this, uh, this proposal passes or not. And that's a commitment that I can give you on behalf of city planning. Well, the only reason we got that is because I got this legislation and we're pushing it. So that we want to make sure that in the, in the future, that this is a tool that we can use. Uh, when we have worked with our community group and we have, you know, zoning, suggest, uh, application, whatever, that we have come together, that we can get a speedy review. And that is the point of the legislation. We will always work with you to get a speedy review, but we will continue to discharge our obligation to ensure that an application is complete. That includes things like a full environmental analysis being complete, and we are just happy to work with you toward that end. Thank you, Chair, but we wanted to overcome as many roadblocks as we can. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Councilor, I just want to follow up with uh, a couple of uh, quick points. If you look at the legislation that we're proposing, it, it's pretty narrowly tailored specifically just to text amendments and specifically to agencies. How, in the last four years of this administration, how many similar applications do you think this would apply to? So I'm raising this because I understand obviously your concern that the floodgates are going to uh, open wide and we're going to see a mad rush, but I'm just curious as to the actual number because we specifically drafted the legislation so that it would be very targeted and limiting for what we perceive as public applications that are for the public good and that are coming from different city agencies or bodies, including your agencies and our 
legislative body as well. So do you have a sense of how many of these have actually come before you since 2013 in the pre-application process? Uh, I don't have a number. I would, I would submit that it's, it's not the majority of our applications or even close to the majority. But I don't know the number, but we can 10, get it to you. Uh, if thousand, you include mayoral agencies, EPC yeah. keeps in, in business alone. So I would say more than 10 certainly more than 10 over the last few years. We can tell you how many. Okay, we so tell you let's exclude the mayoral that. agencies because okay. just to be fair, mm -hmm. you, you're part of the same administration, right. right? So if you folks want to fast track something, you can get it done, which is okay. certainly the way it should be, right? The mayor runs the city Department of City Planning, City Planning Commission effectively and all of the relevant agencies. So let's talk about the other agencies that are not directly under your control, like the borough president or the city council. Is okay. it fair to say that we can count on one hand how yes. many of those I, I would come say through? that's fair to say. Yes. Okay, so I just think it's important for the record to reflect that the proposal that we're making is pretty limited, right? It's not the kind of thing that we're suddenly going to see a major change in terms of a mad rush to get this done. And just uh, if I may just finish uh, my point, uh, that, that even at such, for example, here in the city council, it would require two-thirds approval of the Land Use Committee to actually get it done. And then finally, the way it was tailored was to be very limited specifically just to the zoning text. Mm -hmm. So is that a fair, at least a fair perspective from our part? I, I think it's a fair perspective with just one caveat, though, which is that I do believe that the existence of this option, which is perceived as sort of a way to, in effect, jump the line, will attract um, applicants to request that you do this on their behalf. So we do have a concern that the historic experience with applications from these bodies is not necessarily what will be the case if this, if this passes. Yeah, I mean, so just to be clear, the, the charter already allows the council to, to initiate applications. We don't do it frequently. Yeah. And this particular, this particular piece of legislation would simply uh, allow us to move up part of that process a little bit faster. So my only point is I recognize the concerns of the Department of City Planning. I just think it's important for the record that I don't view this as some sort of radical shift in terms of how we're doing it. And certainly these are not individual members. Two-thirds of the Land Use Committee would have to sign on. As you said, we've had a handful of these over the last four years. I don't think that we're going to have... Uh, a, a mad rush. And I, and I do have a final question, which I think is just uh, important to recognize as well, is that to your credit and to the current chair and previous chair's credit, you've always generally taken the position that you will certify an application as complete even if you disagree with the application. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. And that's one of the points I think that you make, which is that when push comes to shove, that if it does come to shove, that you will ultimately say, okay, we'll certify it, and if it gets voted down, that's the risk that you take that it might get voted down in the City Planning Commission. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, but there's nothing currently in the rules of the law that codifies that. Is that correct? That's just a practice of the, of the Department of City Planning. Is there anything that makes that a requirement? I, and I would say, and not casting aspersions on any prior um, administration, that we are obligated by the Charter to certify complete applications. I think we have that obligation. Well, I think perhaps the prior administrations have quibbled on what the definition of complete is, because I think it is fair to say, without casting aspersions on prior administrations, that prior administrations did not take that view, mm -hmm. and were very clear that they only certified applications when they believed it was complete, or quite frankly, when they wanted it to be complete. So my only point is that in the, in the system of the checks and balances of legislative versus executive power, it is, it is not certainly uh, unwarranted for the legislature to say, hey, you know, while we trust your administration and while, by and large, as you know, we respect the role and the work that the Department of City Planning does, and I've always publicly said that it's one of the hardest working city agencies and you're underappreciated in the work that you do, we don't know what the next mayor is going to hold. And due to this charter's requirements of term limits, we are certain that in a little more than four years there will be a new mayor, and we don't know if that mayor will take the same interpretation as well. So. When we pass legislation, we're taking the long view. So just another perspective simply to share as well. Are there any other council members who have any other uh, questions on this particular piece of legislation? 
So if, if the rest, is there anyone on the panel who wants to testify on this piece of legislation or would you like now to testify on another piece of legislation? We would like to testify on the other two pieces of uh, legislation that. Well, we would welcome that. Okay. Councillor, whenever, whenever you are ready, why don't we do this? Why don't we first start, because I just want to have some order, why don't we first start with the legislation that is being sponsored by Council Member Espinal on urban agriculture. And so we will allow Council Member Espinal to make an opening statement. And after his statement, you can then make your statement, and then we'll ask questions, and then we'll move on to the third piece as well. Council Member Espinal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman Greenfield, uh, for scheduling this hearing. Uh, you were actually a, a proud supporter, and you really helped facilitate this by telling me whose arms I should bend to make today happen. So thank you for, for all your For the work. record, my, my arm still hurts a little bit, but <laughs> I'm happy to accommodate the requests of Councilmember Espinal. I appreciate it. This is a very important bill. It's intro number 1661, a bill that I introduced in partnership with Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. It would require the city to develop a comprehensive urban agriculture plan to support the development of this in New York City. The comprehensive planning process will look at ways to integrate, in integrate urban agriculture in the city's conservation and resiliency plans and remove the barriers that are currently preventing more businesses from growing. Developing this plan and fostering this industry would, one, be good for the environment. Uh, we would, uh, this would help reduce climate change and urban agriculture would pump more oxygen into our air, use less water than traditional farming systems, and reduce the amount of dirty trucks coming into our communities. Second, it would produce healthy, locally grown food, especially in the city's food deserts. And third, it will help create many new jobs with livable wages for New Yorkers. A 2016 report by the Food Bank New York City showed that my home borough of Brooklyn has a food insecurity rate of 20%, and that is the only borough with a rising trend since 2009. Our city has about 14,000 acres of unused rooftop space, and there are more than 45,000 square feet of publicly owned land in East New York alone. With the use of smart cutting edge technology, we will be able to grow enough food to feed as many as 20 million people in the metropolitan area. However, there is a lack of clarity as to what is and what isn't allowed and the bureaucratic hurdles this developing industry faces sti and that stifles its potential. That's why creating a comprehensive urban agriculture plan is necessary and I'm proud to champion this effort. Thank you. Thank and you. Thanks to all the advocates that have been working on behalf of uh, this bill. Thank you, Council Member. I want to I want to I want to thank uh, Councilmember Espinal especially he is uh, one of our younger and visionary council members he recently passed the legislation correcting uh, creating the equivalent of a deputy mayor position for nightlife and uh, when that gets underway he's going to do the first official New York City night crawl which we're looking forward to as well thank you very much <laughs> and this is another piece of legislation that really is forward thinking and important and environmentally friendly we want to thank you for that, and with that, we will turn it to you, Councillor, to testify on this, and then we will ask questions on this legislation, and then we'll move on to the next item. Thank you. Thank you for giving us the opportunity to testify on intro number 1661, sponsored by uh, Councilmember Espinal. Uh, this is a proposed local law in relation to urban agriculture in New York City. The Department of City Planning and the administration support urban agriculture as an important educational, greening, and community building opportunity in neighborhoods where community gardening is an important part of the landscape. Urban agriculture produces only a small portion of the food our city eats, but plays a critical role in communities for whom access to high quality, affordable, fresh food is limited. Urban farming in New York City, which largely takes place at community-run gardens, provides opportunities for residents to connect with nature, improve the environment, beautify public open space, learn about growing and preparing nutritious food, and form lasting interge intergenerational relationships and social bonds within communities. New York City supports school gardens in over half of the city schools, where children are connected to the science of growing food and essential nutrition education. The city's few commercial farms support the city's environmental goals and offer an economic development opportunity within a niche local food market. Many of our city's community programs, such as a DYCD-funded uh, after-school sites or DIFTA-funded senior citizens, have gardens and offer educational programs about farming, the environment, and good food. There are four food producing farms at NYCHA developments and two more were announced thanks to an investment from the city council. 
Because of the significant value that urban agriculture has for New York City's communities, the city offers a number of initiatives and resources to community gardeners and urban farmers. These programs span a range of agencies and provide materials, support, and assistance to New Yorkers in starting and maintaining gardens and farms in their neighborhoods. Regarding the department's role in these efforts, the New York City zoning resolution allows for urban agriculture in every zoning district in the city, and use groups 4B and 17 specifically include agriculture, calling out greenhouses, nurseries, and truck gardens. Rooftop greenhouses are now allowed by chairperson certification under zone green regulations passed by the council in 2012. Our agency has not identified any barrier in the zoning code to achieving a particular urban agriculture proposal and therefore does not believe this bill is necessary. If the concern is that the zoning resolution is creating hurdles, the department encourages operators and elected officials to come and discuss such challenges with city planning and identify any hurdles that they have with existing zoning. Depending on the issue, the city might be able to address the issue without the need for new legislation or zoning amendments. The Mayor's Office of Food Policy would likewise welcome a meeting with Councilmember Espinal to discuss the intent of this legislation and ways the administration can address any real or perceived barriers to fostering urban agricultural efforts. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anybody else in the panel would like to testify on this today? Okay, well, I will turn it over to Councilmember Espinal for questioning. So, so the administration found that there, that there are no real zoning um, uh, barriers for the industry? Yes. But I, I feel that I've heard from a lot of the advocates and a lot of people who actually uh, own some of these businesses that there are zoning barriers that allow them to grow their business. For example, um, and correct me if I'm wrong, anyone out there, but you can't grow, um, you can't, you can't, you can't farm on your rooftop and also be allowed to sell that, that produce on the ground floor of certain buildings. Okay. Um, Barry will speak to that. Hi. Um, mm -hmm. That isn't true. I'm sorry. Can you just identify yourself for the record, please? Sure. Uh, Barry Dennison from the Department of City Planning. Thank you. Um, you can gr uh, sell things on your zoning lot. So if you're, if you're growing, say, uh, in, a, in a greenhouse, uh, you can sell that product so long as it's on the same lot. Uh, I, I think one of the issues that's been identified is the inability to grow things on one lot and then sell it on another lot if you have residential zoning. And the reason for that is, is that residential zoning is for residents and uh, a store selling things is a commercial use. So if you're doing it uh, in the same lot uh, with something you're producing on the lot, um, we're willing to allow you to do that. But if you create a situation where you know, you're growing on one, on one lot and then you're running a store on another lot, then that becomes a commercial use. And so we have concerns about that um, um, occurring in a residential district. But you certainly could do that in a commercial district and you certainly could do that in a manufacturing district. So you could grow it on a, on, you know, in a residential lot and then sell the product in a commercial lot, in a manufacturing zone lot, or on your own lot, which is, you know, a pretty liberal set of rules. Does the city have any sort of, um, uh, sort of, manual or handbook that could be available to people who are, in, who are interested in urban agriculture? Identifying all of the, the rules and regulations the city has in place? Um, we have nothing specific about urban agriculture, but certainly if people have zoning questions and are trying to understand what the zoning rules are, um, we are more than willing to sit down and talk with people and go through the rules. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, the zoning stuff is sort of complicated, but there are other rules as well that people have to comply with is building code, fire code. Um, there may be um, other issues that people have to deal with. Uh, depending on what they're doing, they may need to, you know, hire a professional to help them walk through the process, which is true of virtually any type of, of use that happens on a piece of land. I mean, the, the rules are complicated. 
They're, they're very complicated, and, and um, I think there's a lot of concern uh, within the community of, um, you know, building codes that need to be followed, uh, fire safety codes that need to be followed. You know, there's, there's um, you know, hydroponic farms happening within buildings and, and all types of farming happening within buildings, and um, they, there's no clear guidance uh, for that community of what well, rules they should be following. Well, I, I think I, I, we've seen in Boston uh, a few years ago, they actually adopted legislation like this one and spent uh, a year to really come up with a comprehensive plan of what the, what the community has to follow and the industry has to follow in order to uh, be operating up to code. So this, this is a situation where we actually have an industry that wants to be regulated. They want to have rules to follow because it will help them not only uh, do their work here, but also uh, get in investment funding from people who, who want to invest in the industry, which is very difficult now because the city hasn't officially recognized um, uh, urban agriculture. Um, you, you know, you're, you're, you're correct. It, it's, it's complicated and a plan might be the right way to go. But before we get to a plan, we'd like to like sit down with yourself, sit down with the advocates. Um, and, and obviously urban agriculture is very, you know, there's a lot of different, they're commercial people, they're nonprofits, um, they're just people who are doing it as a hobby. You know, we'd like to sort of sit down with all the different groups, understand the different issues that different groups have and then come back and think about, well, maybe a plan is appropriate or not, because uh, right now there's a lot, you know, you have a lot of different th pieces here, and you're just passing legislation without giving us the time to really figure out what, the, what we're supposed to do with the plan. Yeah, the legislation simply just asks the administration to sit down and create a, a think tank to uh, create a policy uh, moving well, forward, uh, you know, with, with, with the amount of appropriate time to do that. I, think do, well, I guess the question is, do we really need legislation to ask us to sit down? Just ask us to sit down and we certainly will do it. We're willing to spend as much time as is needed to figure out the rules. I, I've, I've had many prior experiences where sitting down didn't get me any results, and usually the legislation has helped me get results. So, you know, this is the, the reason for this bill. But I am open to that dialogue, and I'm sure people in, in the community uh, would be willing to sit down. Uh, but, but I think at the end of the day, um, uh, we have to have something concrete that's going to push our city uh, to really come up with a, with a policy report. Uh, something that, that the city council and the mayor's office can, can take to, to uh, assist, assist the uh, industry and the community. Uh, so with, with that said, you know, I also want to say, you know, we, we as a city are, are behind in the conversation. Yes, we are supporting uh, he, here and there with, with funding and certain rules that are being changed that would allow urban farming in, in, in certain areas <coughs> that wasn't allowable before. But you know, other cities like Boston, you know, have have taken have taken uh, the, the 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 task to to make sure that they they as a city support this industry. And I think that uh, you know, we with with the amount of rooftops we have, with the amount of warehouses we have, we should be leading this conversation. So we would just like to you know make the final point that we really do welcome an opportunity to sit down and and talk with you and others who are interested in this issue about how we would proceed. And you know, you should not uh, consider our sort of reluctance in uh, you know, embracing this bill to be anything more than a reflection of a concern about the multiple priorities that we all have and how we can you know, work on the various land use issues that the city has. But we would very much be happy to continue this conversation. Okay, the, the city council session is over in about two months, mm -hmm. right? Is there anything you can point to this legislation that you feel right here uh, on, on record that we can change in any way that would make it more feasible for the city to take on? I think, I think we would ask for an opportunity to have a conversation before we answer that so that we maybe could get a little more clarity about exactly what the work product that is, is requested here. So if we could just have a conversation at some point in the very near future about this, we might be able to give you a response. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you. I just want to follow up on a few of the points that you made. I, I certainly understand the consternation that the department has any time we ask you uh, to do something. To, to be fair, is there anything that you read in this legislation that would require you to actually change any legislation? In the way we understand it, it would, it would essentially require you simply to come up with a, 
comprehensive plan so that essentially we could clarify some of these uh, issues. I'll give you an example. My son is 10 years old. He's in fifth grade. He comes to me the other day and he says, Daddy, he says, I'm thinking of running for student government. I said, really? So that's so interesting. don't do it. <laughs> yes, yes. I said, do you, you want an unpaid position in politics? I don't know if I would recommend that. But I said, well, what are your, some of your ideas? He says, well, here's an idea that I have. He says, you know, we play on the roof in our school. And he says, you know, not all the kids like to play. Maybe we could actually grow some plants instead, and maybe we could have, like, a vegetable garden, and we could have, like, some tomatoes and cucumbers and things like that. And you know what the problem for my 10-year-old is? That neither he nor the school uh, nor his teachers really have clarity on how you can do that and if you can do it. And what happens if you have a surplus of tomatoes? Can you actually sell those tomatoes? And so I think that's really the conversation that we're trying to have. I don't think anyone is trying to sort of paint the, the department into a corner. It's really more of... There is a lot of conversations I can refer you. I'm going to plug this because I happen to be an adjunct law professor at Brooklyn Law School. There is a wonderful report called From Food Deserts to Just Desserts, Expanding Urban Agriculture in New York City Through Sustainable Policy by Tatiana Pulowski at Brooklyn Law School, and it was supervised by Professor Deborah Bechtel. And some 70 pages on conversations about different zoning and the ability to get things done and how you would do it Nobody wants to grow tomatoes on their roof and then get a building inspector to come and shut them down, right? And so I think that's really the concern, which is that if something is not really clear, sure, we could always take the position, come to us and ask us, but do we really want, like, 10-year-olds sending letters to the Department of City Planning saying, like, what do I do over here? Or would we rather have a comprehensive plan that lays it out and says, okay, we reviewed it, here's what makes sense, and here what does, here's what doesn't make sense. We might say, for example, you know, on the 100th floor of a skyscraper, we may not want you to plant tomatoes for the following reasons, but, you know, on, you know, up until the fifth floor, you can't. I don't know. My point is that we haven't really explored these issues. It seems like a unique opportunity where we could, in fact, engage in sustainable, sustainable farming. As you know, a lot of the produce that is shipped to us here on the eastern seaboard doesn't even make it here. By the time it gets here, much of that produce is actually spoiled, and then it's destroyed, which is really not environmentally friendly either. So the idea that we can actually grow things locally, perhaps even organically, there's a lot of benefits to that as well. So I don't think we're attempting to push you in the corner or to say you must change the law, but the reality is, for better or for worse, mostly for better, you're the experts. And you know all the rules, and so you could come up with a plan, and we're not saying do it tomorrow. I think the legislation gives till, I think, is, is it the summer of 2018? 18 or so, so there's plenty of time. If you need more time, we're happy to have uh, some conversations about that. I think folks just want clarity. What can you do? What can you not do? And once they have clarity, then we can come back and say, okay, well, do we really agree that you shouldn't be able, for example, to grow on your roof and then sell on your stoop? Right, let's have a conversation about that, right? If I have surplus tomatoes that I'm selling and I'm growing my backyard, maybe I should be able to have a uh, literally a yard sale where I'm selling tomatoes. I mean, those are the kinds of conversations that we'd like to have. And I think that's really the way to do that, really, is to have a plan that we can then use as a focal point to then have conversations based on that, because I think the area of this law is rather murky because there haven't been that much interest, and now we do have renewed interest and capabilities of doing this in a way that we haven't had before. Well, firstly, I'm happy to tell you that you can tell your son that zoning does not preclude them having a rooftop garden on the school. So he needs to check with the school. <laughs> and, and if they're okay with it and they meet the um, you know, uh, building code and other requirements, that would be a permissible activity. Uh, but, uh, counselor, but here's what you just said, right? Yes. A very critical point. If they, need the, if they meet the building code and other requirements, that would be a permissible activity. My 10-year-old doesn't know what the building code is. He doesn't know what the other requirements are. And most people who want to do this don't know either. I think that's the point. We, we, all we're asking is just let's have a plan, some clarity, something that you can flip through and say, okay, this is permissible, this is not. And incidentally, you folks are the experts. You can tell us if it's not permissible, we can then turn around and say, well, maybe we can change the rules and regulations. I think the lack of clarity prevents people from doing this, and I think that's sort of part of the concern, which is we think you're best place to clarify these as opposed to the opposite, which is try and then fail and then fight with the relevant city agency? Well, I would, I would feel duty-bound to say that we are not the experts on building code, fire code, and many other regulations that 
affect all land use. So we may be the experts on zoning, but there are many other parties who would need to be engaged in these conversations. And so, as Barry said, I think one of the challenges here is that like any other land use, if you want to start any commercial endeavor or a home-based business that uh, implicates land use, there are multiple stops of inquiry about whether or not it is permissible. And there is not a single location in city government and that you can get all of the answers. We don't have that. We don't have a comprehensive guide to commercial development. It may just have, you know, developed over time more robustly, but the challenge is that there are many layers to this. And so what you would be asking us to do is to be sort of like the collator of all of that. And I, I would tell you that that is a very large effort. No, but you guys are so good at it. I have They're so much not. faith. No, you are. Let me tell. Let me tell you why. Because the Department of City Planning, you, you always underestimate. You're so humble. You always <laughs> underestimate your abilities. It, you're really the one agency in New York City that thinks about the future of the city and what it's going to look like and how many people are living here. And you're thinking of those big questions in a way that other agencies are not. And to be fair, in the legislation, we specifically say that the Department of City Planning, in cooperation with relevant agencies and stakeholders, so that would be other folks, including folks in the industry, but also other agencies as well, you'd bring them in. I certainly don't expect that you would interpret the DOB code. But I think the point that I'm making is, and I think this is a critical point, is that if it's an empty lot and I want to build a house, and I buy a lot and I want to build a house, I'm going to hire an expert, and that's essentially what I'm going to do. Right? I'm going to hire an architect, and then I might hire an expediter, and it's going to cost me tens of thousands of dollars just to get the plans approved, and then I'm going to build a house. And the answer is because I want to build a house. Or if someone's a developer and they want to do something on a very large commercial scale, they're going to do the same thing. They're going to invest a lot of money. I think the concern that we have over here is that these are just regular New Yorkers who just would like to use their space, whether it is their porch or their backyard or their rooftop, and we want to make it as simple and easy as possible. We don't want these folks to have to hire experts and consultants and zoning regulators and then DOB enforcement experts to tell me, okay, we have now concluded after $18,000 of research, you can plant six tomato vines in your backyard. Because realistically, what's going to happen is no one's going to do it. And so I think that's really the concern. And then on the flip side, there may be an opportunity, which I think what Councilmember Espinal calls along with the borough president in his op-ed, which is there may be an economic opportunity here for New Yorkers that's untapped as well, where we can make it clear for small and independent business owners who say, you know what, maybe I'll do this on a little bit of a larger scale. This is a good thing, and we're sourcing it, and it's local, and it's sustainable, and like I said, in some cases, it's going to be organic. And we're just trying to make it easier for folks, and for better or for worse, and I think mostly for better, you're the experts. Mm -hmm. You are. This is what you do. You think about these issues all day. Mm -hmm. Anita, I know that before you go to sleep, you think about what's the city going to look like, and how big <laughs> should the buildings be, and how small should they be, and what's the impact having on neighborhoods. Nobody is more qualified to do this than you are. This is a compliment. This is us in the council saying we trust the Department of City Planning. Oh, you are some really? of the smartest people that we know. Mm -hmm. You think about these issues all the time. And we're not entrusting any other agency with the responsibility except for you. And so if I were you, I would say thank you so much. We really appreciate that. And let's get to work. I will say thank you so much. We really appreciate it. And we are prepared to get to work with Councilmember Espinal to discuss these issues. All right. Fair enough. Okay. Any other questions or comments from council members on this piece of legislation? Any other individuals on the panel would like to weigh in on this? Okay, hearing none, we'll, work on, we'll move on to the final piece of legislation, which is my legislation, which is the POPs cleanup bill. Council, do you have some comments you'd like to make on this as well? Yes, yes, thank I Thank you do. very much. Um, we would like to testify on intro 1692A, which is sponsored by Chair Greenfield and is a proposed amendment to Local Law 116 regarding pr privately owned public spaces. Privately owned public <coughs> spaces, or POPs, are public spaces located on private property, provided and maintained by a private owner for public use in exchange for additional floor area or zoning waivers. In ramping up to comply with Local Law 116, the department has hired additional staff to manage the POPs program out of the Manhattan office. The department has been migrating the prior database into a new, more advanced modern system, as well as updating the data. 
Once the updates are finalized, the data on the city open data portal will be refreshed and also made accessible via a new interactive map on the POPS DCP website with detailed information on each POPS as required by the recent legislation. The map is expected to be completed in early 2018. The department is also continuously working with DOB by providing site plans and approvals for DOB's inspections when requested. The, par the department does not oppose these amendments. We do, however, want to indicate that the department has been discussing enforcement with DOB and the law department. Specifically, we have been exploring the city pursuing affirmative litigation against egregious violators, as well as potential ways to increase penalties for serious violations. This proposed bill establishes penalty amounts, but we will suggest amendments to ensure that we are not precluded from imposing greater or additional penalties in the future. We welcome any opportunity to work with the council and interested stakeholders to ensure that POPs are maintained and compliant. The zoning regulations governing POPs offer a valuable public benefit. We, hear, we very much appreciate the opportunity to testify on all of these matters. Thank you very much, Councillor. I actually am the sponsor of this legislation. It's something we've been working on for several years now. I just want to explain for those people who are in the audience and watching at home what this means is that in the city of New York, we have bonus incentives that allow developers to get extra space to build if they allow to have their private spaces open to the public. Now, you'll see this a lot. You'll walk down the street, and you'll see like a small seating area. Sometimes there'll be a fountain. People will sit. They'll have a sandwich. They'll talk on their phones. They're smoking, even though they're not supposed to be smoking. But in any event, this is a wonderful amenity. There are millions of square feet of space in the city that are open to the public. The problem is that in some of these cases, when these buildings were designed, the space is actually inside the building. And in the post-9-11 world, trying to get into a building is very difficult to access the public space. And in fact, working together with the controller's office, we found that some 50% of these spaces, if you try to access them, and there are millions of square feet of public space, and you try to go into a building, they say, where are you going? And you say, well, I'm going to the backyard over there just to sit back and get some fresh air and to read my newspaper. They'll say, sorry, if you don't have an appointment, you can't come in. And that's not fair, because in the city where we desperately lack public space, the purpose of giving these developers these bonuses to get back these millions of square feet in public space was to make it accessible to the public. So we changed a law that I sponsored, which essentially would create several things. Most importantly, it creates a database so that you will be able to go online and find out where these public spaces are. You'll then be able to complain online about these public spaces if they're not accessible to the public. We also have an enforcement mechanism where we have the Department <coughs> of Buildings can now is required to actively inspect to make sure these spaces are open to the public. And literally, there are hundreds of locations and millions of square feet of spaces that will be open. We are amending this bill to allow for some increased penalties. And the Council for the Department of City Planning is asking us to further amend the bill to allow the Department of City Planning to, if they would like, add even more penalties to ensure that this is not the ceiling for the penalties, but it is the floor. In the spirit of our being amenable today, I will accept those amendments, and we will redraft the legislation with those suggestions that you've made. We will re-age it, and hopefully we'll get it passed in before the end of the year, so thank you very much. Is there anyone else that has any questions or comments on this legislation? You see how efficiently government works? Isn't this great? We have an idea. They have an idea back. They accept our idea. We move on. This is wonderful. All right. Um, is the panel now done? We are. We have concluded. So we will now dismiss the panel. Thank you very much. And we are going to go back uh, to our original bill that we were discussing, which is Council Member Chin's legislation. And if there are individuals who have not yet signed up, please sign up. And the folks who have so far signed up on Intro 65 to testify are Paula Siegel and Michael Slattery. So Paul and Michael, please come up here. Is there anybody else? This is actually the only panel in Intro 1685. So if you are here to testify on Councilmember Chin's legislation, this is your only opportunity to do so. If you have not yet signed up, or if you think you have signed up and haven't had the opportunity, can you raise your hand, perhaps? OK, so I don't see anyone else on this. And then we will then move on to the next item, which will be Councilmember Espinal's legislation. I actually just want to confirm, on my POPs bill, we had nobody testifying. Is there anybody here who would like to testify on the POPs bill? Okay, so hearing, hearing none, we're going to move on on that as well. And we are now going to move on to the 
legislation, which is intro 1685. I see Michael Slattery here. I do not see Paula Siegel. Is Paula she here? Had to leave. She had to go to the Paula had to leave, but we will accept her testimony. Michael, the floor is all yours. Um, good afternoon. I'm Michael Slattery, representing the Real Estate Board of New York, and we are opposed to this bill. Uh, we, bel we believe that the current pre-referral process does add value uh, to the system, and we would welcome certainly a chance to make that process more efficient, uh, as Council Member Chin has suggested. Uh, we just would not like to make it uh, more efficient for just council members. Uh, the other part of this is that the uh, N New York's physical and economic growth and its success as a global city relies on as of right development and an orderly process to introduce new planning proposals as our city's needs change from an industrial economy to a service economy, from a city with 7 million residents to 9 million, our zoning resolution has needed to change to accommodate this growth in a reasonable and rational manner in accordance with well-considered plan. This process has given builders and investors an opportunity to make prudent, rational decisions about their investment. I think intro 1685 really is an assault on as of right development and that's one of the reasons why we oppose this. There's been a couple of suggestions made about the scope of this bill. Uh, that two-thirds requirement is a real stringent requirement. We've just witnessed today a, the most, one of the most contentious uh, projects that the council has addressed with Pfizer, and it easily got two-thirds votes. So I'm not sure that two-thirds is a real threshold and a hard thing to achieve in the council. Also, uh, the an attempt to say that this really, the text amendment is not a big deal. And I would argue that it is a big deal. So much of the, com the complaints that are taking place here uh, in communities have to do with building heights. And the easiest way to address building heights is to introduce a text amendment that lowers building heights. Presumably, lowering a building height has no environmental impacts on the neighborhood and therefore could be expeditiously moved move forward. So we see this bill as a real threat to as of right development. We think the planning process, which certainly could be moved more efficiently, uh, serves a purpose uh, and we are opposed to this bill. Thank you very much. Council Member Chin, do you have any questions or comments? Well, I didn't know that my bill was a threat to as of right development. Well, I, I figured, knew that. I figured when you said that communities were under you attack. You got to do I something figured. to all these as of right development that's going up in my district that they didn't even have to come in and say hello. And I got this gigantic tower you know, going up all over my district. I didn't know my bill couldn't really punch it out. I, wow, I, I, I didn't thank know, you. I didn't, know that, I didn't know that those invest, those investments which create jobs and make uh, tax revenue uh, was such an attack on communities. But uh, I figured uh, if they were an attack, then I guess what the bill has done is really an assault, so. You know, just don't just use jobs and investment. What we're looking at is how do we protect our community from overdevelopment and from some, you know, so-called asset right development or minor modification development that really do not have full community input. It's not, you know, yes, we welcome good paying job, but we also want to make sure mm -hmm. there's adequate number of affordable housing and make sure people have light and air and don't have all these negative impacts. And that's happening, especially in my district, so we want to have a tool that we can level the playing field. I, I recognize that the impetus for this was the decision uh, by city planning to rule that it was a minor modification as opposed to a major modification which would trigger a ULA review. Uh, and and when, uh, when government does something that you don't like, uh, I think there's a mechanism to deal with that. Uh, sometimes that's litigation. Uh, but, but I'm not sure, I'm that not sure though like. that the the way to deal with that is to create a mechanism which really opens the door to kinds of actions which we think would really threaten as of right development. Well, I think that that is your point of view. And from our point of view, it's really give the community an opportunity to level the playing field. That community could have input in how they want to see their neighborhood develop, how they can fight against some of these overdevelopment that's really, you know, hurting the neighborhood. And communities have always had the opportunity to create plans that fit their needs. Uh, I think too often the concern, certainly of late, has been community reaction, community opposition that stops important projects. 
and I think the part of the intent here is to really leapfrog projects that are underway uh, to stop them in their tracks. And I think that sends a chilling message to people who want to invest in New York to say that any time I'm through the process here, I could be stopped and have to go back and start over again. That's the, f that's the fearful part of this bill. Well, that's the fear, but that is not the intention. We want to make sure that the community have full input, and there should be more transparency in terms of, you know, right now application going in. We don't even know how the community is being affected uh, and how we can get those information from DCP. So what we're asking for is a fighting chance for us to make sure that we have the opportunity to protect the community and give the community full input. So, Michael, I just want to clarify uh, one, one point about the bill. Just to be clear, I just, maybe, I just want to make sure we both understand the legislation. This legislation would not give any of these bodies, including the council, the ability to change the zoning, right? Just your understanding of that as well. I just want to be clear, Michael. All it essentially would do is, because these are requests that are coming directly from government agencies, it would allow us to skip the initial, what is called pre-certification Step. Do you have another understanding of that? I just think it's important just so that we're, we, at least we understand the bill uh, correctly. I think I understand the bill correctly. I think the real concern is that council members, one, listen to their constituency uh, and then c could be made to recommend this action. Uh, you had suggested in looking at this that it still requires a two-thirds vote of the land use committee. And as I pointed out, I think getting two-thirds vote is an easy, accomplish, easy thing to accomplish uh, in this council. You think it's easy? E easy. Oh, Michael, I, I, I have a lot of respect for you. And uh, I would as respectfully, I as the chair of the Land Use Committee, I assure you that I spend dozens of hours a week trying to get two-thirds votes. And I work with some nearly 40 staff members in the Land Use Committee every single day to try to make sure that everyone's on the same page. I assure you, it is, it is not easy. We just make it look easy. There's a difference between then you easy be commended for that. and making it look easy. It just looks easy because we're very good, happily, at what we do, yep. and we compromise. But the point that I'm making, Michael, is that, that it's not, and I understand, I understand your general bigger philosophical objection, and that I respect. I just do want to make, it was a genuine question. I just want to make sure that we understand you don't read anything in this legislation as giving us powers beyond skipping that one step, which would then still require, still require that application to be certified by the Department of City Planning. Is that correct? The, what I suggested was that if, instead of it being just something that council members could do, that if you're going to expedite the process, that should be open to everyone, including the private sector and private developers. Okay, so that's interesting. So you're offering us some, so you're adding a different perspective, which well, is well, that the potentially adding, open it to everyone and not just to those well, I think I was legislative to bodies. I was trying to respond to yeah. Councilmember Chin's complaint that the pre-certification process took too much time. Uh, you know, the real estate community has been complaining about that for decades. Uh, Blueprint was part of the way to try to help that process. Uh, and now I, I think there are certainly people who are using Blueprint who would complain and share the council members' concern that that's too long and too lengthy uh, and would like to see that made more efficient. So that we could certainly support. Okay, good, great. I, just want, I, I genuinely just wanted to make sure that you weren't reading the bill differently than we were in terms of our, our, our understanding. I appreciate the feedback. It's helpful to have the perspective. We thank you very much. Is there anybody else who's here to testify on Council Member Chin's bill? Okay, so we are formally closing the hearings on my pop's bill and Councilmember Chin's bill. Thank you. And we are now going to move on to the next part of the hearing, which is the final part of the hearing, which is the hearing on Councilmember Espinal's urban agriculture plan. And uh, I will actually turn over the committee chair at this point to Councilmember Espinal. I have to attend some meetings across the street, and Councilmember Espinal, as you know, is the greatest champion of urban agriculture that we have here in New York City, and I'm certain he's going to do an outstanding job. And so I will turn it over to him, and then he will call up the folks who will be testifying at this hearing. Councilmember Espinal, take it away.
Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to chair the Land Use Committee for the day, and I think it's a great honor to be able to chair this committee on a very important topic that's very personal to me as well. We have 46 people signed up to speak today. So um, if you feel inclined to speak, stay on the list. If you're like, oh, I don't want to wait that long, I might be in the end, let us know. Uh, but we have to, for, for that reason, we have to limit the clock to one or two minutes, um, unfortunately. We'll push, we'll push for two for a little while. Uh, if you end up being one, please don't get offended. Uh, just trying to make sure we all get home at a reasonable hour. Um, so with that said, we'll start with two minutes. With that said, um, I want to come up to the first panel. We have Josh Levin, John Rudikoff, Tatiana Palowski. Betty McIntosh, and Deborah Martin. Yeah, you just may, may begin to say your name for the record. Certainly. Uh, my name is Josh Levin, uh, Director of Business Development for Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. Uh, so I guess I'll start. Um, I will be uh, presenting testimony on behalf of Brooklyn Borough President Eric Adams. I want to thank uh, Councilmember Espinal and Councilmember Greenville, the chairs, uh, and the Land Use Committee for giving me the opportunity to provide comments at this public hearing. Additionally, I would like to commend Councilmember Espinal for introducing this legislation as well as council colleagues for co-sponsoring this important legislation. Uh, the impetus for this le legislation stems from meeting with several urban agriculture companies during my visits to neighborhoods throughout Brooklyn. I am inspired by the entrepreneurial spirit that produces fruits and vegetables in Brooklyn using new forms of tech-focused agriculture like closed-loop aquaponics and aeroponics. Unfortunately, I heard time and time again for, uh, uh, of the difficulty of receiving city agency approval for these companies, which were often being set up on rooftops and in warehouses. This frustration prompted the most logical next step, which was to bring city agencies to the table to speak with advocates and industry leaders on the issue of permits and regulations. Our office hosted a roundtable in partnership with Councilmember Espinal at Brooklyn Borough Hall on April 17, 2016 with 10 city agencies, including the Department of City Planning, and over 20 urban agriculture companies and nonprofits organizations. The takeaway was clear that agriculture is only mentioned a handful of times in the zoning resolution, and city agencies were placing responsibility on one another to regulate this emerging industry, but no one was taking any clear regulatory responsibility. This resulted in more questions than answers for urban agriculture companies and no clear path for, uh, for fresh food and job creation. While well, we have been successful, uh, uh, like, there's been successful companies like Gotham Greens and Brooklyn Grange take root. Many more companies have labored trying to get their businesses off the ground. Meanwhile, cities like Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, and Newark are plowing forward with an urban agriculture revolution. Intro 1661 asks New York City Department of City Planning to take the first step in playing catch up uh, with so many other city agencies by developing a comprehensive urban agriculture plan that addresses land use and other regulatory measures. Um, I guess I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Betty McIntosh. I enthusiastically support the proposal to develop an urban agriculture plan. I have been volunteering for the last seven years at a rooftop farm in Hell's Kitchen. All the produce is donated to a local food pantry. I am also a member of Manhattan Community Board 4, which covers Chelsea and Hell's Kitchen. I am speaking as an individual. An urban agriculture plan which facilitates farms that grow food is urgently needed for several compelling reasons. To provide free and low-cost fresh vegetables to people who can't afford them. To help improve air quality in many neighborhoods. To promote environmental sustainability. And to educate youth about food production, nutrition, and food justice. I suggest the following. Work closely with local communities, neighborhood organizations, 
community boards, and elected officials at every stage in developing the plan. Create structures for running of new farms that involve local organizations and residents. Develop a program that provides startup funding for new farms, both in ground and on roofs, for vacant lots existing in new buildings. Identify appropriate sites for farms and aggressively approach property owners, particularly nonprofits, to develop farms. Identify urban farm experts and support them to assist in developing new farms. Provide zoning incentives for new buildings to provide space for farms. Consider floor area bonuses and other zoning mechanisms. To take advantage of these incentives, the sponsor of these new farms would need to donate a significant percentage of produce to low-income households. A smaller percentage of produce could be kept for building residents or commercial uses such as res at restaurants. Ensure new buildings do not create shadows over existing and new farms and provide resources for every school to have farms nearby or at their building. Thank you. Good afternoon, Council Member Espinal. Uh, I am Deborah Martin, Executive Director of New York Restoration Project, and I'm here to applaud this uh, intro 1661 and your and Borough President Adams' efforts to bring some coherence and order to and clarity to urban agriculture in our city. As Executive Director of New York's only citywide conservancy focused on low-income communities, I see the important multifaceted role open space plays in our communities every day. The 52 community gardens under our care are in many neighborhoods the only high quality open space within walking distance and they're also often the only source of affordable fresh produce. In our spaces, communities decide what uses their land should be put to. So not surprisingly, 70% of New York Restoration Project's community gardens are dedicated to urban agriculture. Last year, our sites produced approximately 89,000 pounds or 44 tons of produce. That's on less than 10 acres of land. I don't need to tell you what access to free fresh food does for persons' physical and mental health and their wallets, of course. In food deserts concentrated in our most vulnerable communities, these connections resonate even more. These spaces also act, and, and I want to point out, as launching pads for other things, like future environmental leaders. We have trained some 900 AmeriCorps, with, with support of the AmeriCorps program in green jobs, who now are spread out across the city, New York Botanic Garden, working for the city, other places. We start the training early with our garden growers program, working with local public schools who come into gardens, and we train, uh, we teach children about how food grows, and often they tell us it's the first time that they've touched a worm or touched the soil. This work has a huge impact, it's profound, uh, and we know that there's much more our city could benefit from uh, a co coherent plan, and there's also more land that can be used for these purposes. Uh, Municipal Art Society's recent public assets report identified more than 3,000 properties owned by the city classified as having no current use. So that totals 1,800 acres. If we open that up to urban ag and other public uses, uh, public access, because they are public, it would be like adding two more central parks to our city. So uh, in conclusion, NYRP strongly supports this intro. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Tatiana Pulowski. Um, I'm a 2017 graduate of Brooklyn Law School, where I was a fellow with the Center of Urban Business Entrepreneurship. I'm also the author of the white paper, uh, previously cited by the uh, chair, so thank you for that. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to testify before your committee in support of bill number 1661. Uh, um, and having researched this topic extensively in law school, I conducted a comparative analysis of uh, numerous urban agriculture programs across U.S. cities, as some have been mentioned. I'd like to present a case for why urban ag is vital for individuals, particularly those in lower income communities, as well as for businesses, and why creating a comprehensive plan to expand existing urban ag policies is key for a healthier, cleaner, and more efficient New York. The New York has the biggest urban ag system in the country. There are two complex and interrelated issues, which are low access to fresh produce and high land values, and they require more attention and bolder, broader action through comprehensive planning. I'm going to speak, uh, skip, uh, skip the part about food deserts, um, as we already know what they are, but they are a very, very big issue, 
and an, a comprehensive plan is, I believe, the only way uh, that they can be ameliorated. The two broad goals of expanding urban ag policy in New York, uh, which is bringing fresh produce and affordable produce to all corners of the city and giving urban farmers more options to utilize the city's limited space to meet their profit margins, are not mutually exclusive and can be met with one comprehensive plan that, one, empowers local communities with more urban ag opportunities by ensuring that income and location are not a barrier to food access, and two, bolsters the innovative options of cutting-edge urban farmers to continue building efficient vertical farms. To meet these goals, the comprehensive plan should take stock of the city's existing resources, including agencies, policies, and initiatives, to identify how to best incorporate urban ag into an established framework, and also to develop a clear policy which assesses roadblocks to urban ag practices and meets the needs of low-income communities, small-scale businesses, and large-scale urban ag ventures by amending the zoning code. First, I would like to know that the Mayor's Office has readily acknowledged the importance of environmental sustainability and food policy, dedicating city resources and providing tax incentives for energy conservation, preserving green space, and aiding the health and wellness of New Yorkers. These initiatives have already resulted in a greener, more sustainable New York. Thus, given the many urban ag-related goals of the offices of sustainability, resiliency, and food policy, the comprehensive plan should streamline existing initiatives by creating one centralized, dedicated program that covers all aspects of urban ag policy under one umbrella, perhaps as an offshoot of the city's Office of Food Policy. This plan should aim to align itself with the goals of the sustainability plans already in place, such as the City Council's Food Works Vision Plan and the Mayor's 1 NYC plan. Accountability should also be taken into the measures uh, to ensure follow-through. The plan should also address the zoning code. Rooftop farming is only allowed in commercial and industrial zones. Greenhouses are allowed only on top of non-residential buildings and growing and selling produce on the same lot without restrictions only in industrial zones. The code is silent on potential rooftop farming as a model, as well as on indoor farming and vertical farming, ambiguities that are particularly significant given the large amount of usable roofs, vacant buildings, and unused indoor space such as basements. The detrimental reality of the current zoning code's restrictions is that produce cannot be grown inside or on top of many buildings and residential zones, which impacts the physical health of lower income New Yorkers and the financial health of smaller scale urban farmers. To remedy these shortcomings, the zoning code amendment should clearly establish definitions of urban agriculture and its various types, enumerate and expand allowable uses in each district, and lift existing restrictions on sales and greenhouse uses. I have to ask you the time to wrap up. Yep, I'm done. Thank you. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> it was good. <clears throat> I, I, want, I want to commend my colleague's effort. Uh, I want to start by thanking uh, City Council's Committee on Land Use and specifically uh, Temporary Council Chair um, Espinal. Uh, my name is John Rudikoff. I'm the CEO and Managing Director of the Center for Urban Business Entrepreneurship at Brooklyn Law School. Uh, the center trains its students to serve and work alongside early stage startups and studies and shines a spotlight on new industries and uh, what these entities portend in the marketplace. Um, I want to begin by applauding the leadership of our friends, the Borough President Eric Adams, and Councilmember Espinal and their efforts to make Brooklyn and New York City the next frontier for the growth of the urban agriculture industry. Uh, joining me today uh, in testifying is Brooklyn Law School graduate and CUBE fellow Tatiana Polowski, uh, who's a tenacious, whose tenacious commitment and incisive scholarship deserve much credit for all of us being here today. Uh, her white paper is an excellent scholarly work that explores precedent and policy in laying out what needs to occur here in New York City if urban agriculture is, in fact, to thrive. Tanya completed this work as an independent study under the, the direction of our friend Professor Bechtel and with the intention of creating a roadmap for legislative action. Uh, when CUBE was first conceived, the ambition was to lasso the extraordinary entrepreneurial activities in Brooklyn so that our students would be equipped for meaningful legal careers in the 21st century's changing economy. Uh, that has been a really unique perch in the sense that again and again our clinics encounter innovators and entrepreneurs whose businesses and interests and industries present questions on which the law and regulation are yet to weigh in meaningfully. Urban agriculture clients have presented just such a challenge. What activities, we are asked, under existing New York City code are in fact permitted? Put simply, until New York City clearly delineates what urban agriculture practices are permitted, such efforts will be rele relegated to the ad hoc and fringe applications. Venture capital, investment dollars, investment banking dollars will remain invariably on the sideline, handi handicapping efforts to effectively scale as we've seen in other markets such as Newark. The proposed legislation to develop a comprehensive urban agriculture plan is an essential next step in the process of establishing New York City 
as a global hub for urban agriculture. Uh, where we stand today, without any official action taken, New York City is already a veritable hotbed of urban agriculture activities. New York City is one of the biggest urban agriculture systems in the country, which includes rooftops and gardens, vertical farming, hydroponic and aquaponic farming systems. Thank you. Thanks, John. I appreciate all of your testimony. Anyone want to respond to what DCP had to say in regards to not having a need to uh, create a plan and that there aren't any really zoning um, regulations in place that's getting in the way for Urban Act to grow? So I would like to address that. Um, they said they would be willing to meet with us. We, uh, like I said, had 10 city agencies, including Department of City Planning, uh, at that meeting with the 20 um, members of the New York City Ag Collective. Uh, there was a lot of um, questions that still came out of that, and we were working uh, with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability until leadership changes, uh, but the follow-up was not sufficient in, in our opinion, and it left a lot of other questions with the other agencies who for the first time were hearing about urban agriculture, uh, but you know the largest being DCP, DOB, and uh, FDNY since it is an ad hoc approach and we would like to see more clarity uh, so everybody isn't employing a small army of consultants to get through the uh, legal and permitting hurdles. Uh, I, I would say that the, early the earlier testimony presupposed a static image when it comes to the current status of urban agriculture in New York uh, and that all potential uses and technologies have been contemplated and basically start and stop with rooftop farming or potentially farming on empty lots. I think the, the crowd here can testify to the idea that there are uh, incredibly creative and innovative practices that are being tested out throughout our city and our borough uh, right now and many others that we don't anticipate yet. Uh, for those purposes and, and for the purposes of streamlining those efforts and clarifying what is permissible, it is essential that this bill is passed and that we're able to bring all agencies together and compel them to come up with a legible and straightforward plan for adoption. Um, I agree with my colleagues in that it's not a question of whether there are barriers there, there, there are or they're not. It's more that it's an, it's an, what are the opportunities and what's the roadmap and uh, also what are the outcomes because food is one outcome but others are social capital, education, green jobs and that requires a, a cross-agency approach and we certainly don't have that. So this report can lay the groundwork for that. I, I was thinking that Perhaps you could take the leadership role in reaching out to the Department of City Planning for starters and perhaps making a meeting since they did say that they were open to a dialogue and perhaps taking some key people, maybe they're sitting at this table or out here, and putting together some meeting and setting forth the issues one by one. And I, I, I would like to be positive and optimistic that you would make progress. Thank you. All right. Well, thank you all. Appreciate for test your testimony. Thank you. Can I call up um, Diana Mickey, Henry Gordon Smith, Nevin Cohen, Aziz Deccan, Mariella Costa? You can begin. Thank you very much, Councilmember Espinel. Uh, my name is Nevin Cohen, and I'm an Associate Professor of Health Policy at the CUNY Graduate School of Public Health and also Research Director of the CUNY Urban Food Policy Institute. Um, I've studied and written about New York's urban agriculture system for the past 10 years. Uh, as the Policy Fellow of the Design Trust for Public Space, I co-authored uh, this report, Five Borough Farm, 
uh, the first comprehensive assessment of urban agriculture in New York City. I also co-authored the book Beyond the Kale, Urban Agriculture and Social Justice Activism in New York, a study of the potential for urban agriculture to address racial, gender, and class disparities. And I'm currently leading a three-year evaluation of the farms at NYCHA, an innovative public-private partnership that trains NYCHA youth while growing fresh produce for its residents. And I would like to express my strong support for intro 1661. Uh, the need for an urban agriculture plan is detailed in more than 40 pages in Five Borough Farm, and I've appended that to my testimony. Uh, but since 2012, when the report was published, new developments have only increased the importance of a plan. Uh, new public initiatives have been launched to make New York City healthier, more just, and more resilient, from building healthy communities to green infrastructure to housing New York. And urban ag can contribute to achieving the goals of these programs, but only if it's fully integrated into program design. And an urban agriculture plan would require conformity with these and other city plans, giving stakeholders the opportunity to identify how to in integrate uh, urban ag into these other programs. And we're talking about a planning process, not just zoning. And that's really an important distinction. Uh, continuing conflicts between urban ag and competing land uses, most recently around HPD's affordable housing initiative, highlight the need for a public process to decide just how much urban agriculture is appropriate for New York City, where new farms and gardens should be located, methods to protect existing gardens and farms, and a process for supporting current and new farming and gardening activities. And as Beyond the Kale showed, the benefits that people usually attribute to urban agriculture can mask and even exacerbate structural inequities. And a planning process would involve the public in identifying and addre addressing disparities within the urban agriculture system. And I'll leave my colleagues to talk about new forms of commercial agriculture, which also uh, illustrate the need for, for a planning process. Um, and also, we should think about regional agriculture, particularly in the Hudson Valley, because urban farms can complement and support regional agriculture. And that is only something that could be developed through a comprehensive plan. Thank you. I have you. specific revisions, which I'll um, uh, leave for my written yeah, testimony. We, we have all your testimony, yeah. so you know, if, if, if you feel like you didn't get everything in, don't worry, your, your testimony is in, and we will review it. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Uh, thank you, Councilman Espinal and City Council for uh, allowing me to give my support for Bill 1661. My name is Henry Gordon-Smith. I'm founder and managing director of Agritecture Consulting. We help urban agriculture entrepreneurs start those farms. I'm also a founding, uh, founding member of the NYC Ag Collective. I'm going to try and keep it short and focus on the economic opportunity of urban agriculture in New York City. Uh, some estimates uh, say around $9 million is the size of the indoor agriculture industry, the more high-tech forms of urban agriculture. Uh, more recently, about $285 million in investments have come into that industry in particular. I want to ask all of us, what is our stake in that investment? What is our stake in that market? And how are we creating the pathways for those entrepreneurs to uh, develop those businesses and those solutions to provide fresh produce, jobs, and uh, not to mention the secondary benefits of the industry, including new approaches to smart, uh, smart cities, IoT, AI, machine learning, automation. It's beyond just the food and the production. It's the related industries there as well. Uh, the great news is that we have a lot of people here that want to develop these urban farms. The NYC Ag Collective has over 100 jobs already, and we're only one of several organizations acting on this. Uh, how 44 of those people uh, have come from other cities to move here because if you can grow it here, then you can grow it anywhere. I just want to highlight what Josh Levin said, that we did have a meeting <laughs> where we all went there and, and we actually submitted our questions and our concerns and we had a dialogue. And the city agencies that uh, said that they're open to a dialogue were at that meeting and uh, they're not at this meeting anymore as far as I can tell. So I think that's a little bit concerning and I think that that's why we need, we need the plan. Well, thank you for being here. Appreciate it. Um, I think that we, we need that plan because I fully agree that urban agriculture is complicated. There are so many different types and scales and methods. And so if anything, this plan might even be a way for education, uh, for the city agencies to help them understand. Uh, at that meeting, one of the agencies said, vertical farms don't involve us, they're just on the outsides of buildings. So to wrap it up, uh, I'm really in promotion of this uh, bill. My reasons why are in my written testimony. But I think it's a question of what kind of city do we want in the future. We already know we want an ecological and sustainable city, and that does not exist without urban agriculture. Thank you. Hi, my name is Kiana Miki. I'm the executive director of Just Food. Um, thank you for having me and allowing me to submit testimony. Um, 
Um, I'm here with concerns about intro uh, 1661. Um, like some of my fellow um, urban ag colleagues and, and community partners that are here, I'm interested in any legislation that will impact our communities, but I want to ensure that there is equity embedded in the process and in the outcomes. It is well known and documented that urban ag um, is vibrant and um, in New York City and has a long history, um, from abandoned lots turned into community gardens to lar larger urban farms. Um, Long-standing residents, um, when the city, and particularly those communities that are under-resourced, turned soil into rich soil and grew food when other folks have la left. Urban farmers like Cheryl Durant and Kelly Street Garden, um, the youth at East New York Farm, Jeanette at Hattie Carthen, Cindy Worley, and many other um, community leaders are environmental stewards in our community, and they're change makers, urban leaders, and offering opportunities to our youth for trainings, um, planning, um, and other development. So, um, excuse me, um, I'm encouraged um, that there is a comprehensive I'm encouraged that there is an opportunity to build a comprehensive urban ag plan for New York City, but in order for it to be um, comprehensive, it must include um, and benefit those who have worked in the soil, grown food, developed community, um, all at um, severe livelihood and impact. Um, I believe that organizations like Just Food, New York City Community Garden Coalition, and others like Farm School and other community partners possess immense, valuable expertise, knowledge, and should be at the table in developing any urban ag legislation. I worry that the 718 deadline is not sufficient time to build a comprehensive ag plan and that ensures equitable engagement of historically marginalized voices, in particular the low income and folks of color. Sorry, do you, yeah. Keep no, I really do want to keep going. I hear that the term food Just, I, I was hoping you give me a summary or conclusion, sorry. Um, I have reservations of this bill. I think that there's voices at the table that have, um, have not been there. Um, and I think that we all need to be there in order to make sure that when we say community, it's everyone. And when we say advocates, they're speaking about the folks that are most impacted. We're speaking the same language. <laughs> Well, there's been the use of food deserts um, by many people here. That is not a, a term that I prescribe to, and I think some of my other um, fellow urban um, and food justice folks don't because it doesn't speak to the lack of um, uh, equity and there's intentionality in, in, in t and the intentionality of segregation of resources in it. We use terms like food apartheid. Yeah. This is why we're speaking about or speaking against some of those things and wanting to make sure that our voices are included and that our food and the work that we do is also lifted in these plans. Um, from my knowledge, m not myself nor some of my other partners were aware of this until very recently and we're not at other um, meetings or voices. So when we hear advocates or we say community, I haven't felt like I've been a part of that, nor have my partners have been, and I want to make sure moving forward that we right, are. So my, my staff will reach out to you. We should sit down and have a, a real meeting, a conversation about this. Thank you. Okay. Uh, my name is Aziz Dekhan. I'm the executive director of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I want to echo what Kiana just said about uh, not being at the table, about sweat equity, about discrimination, and about food apartheid. Um, I had written, I have a written statement, but I want to do something else. What I'd like to do is take you all off rooftops, get you out of urban warehouses, and back into community gardens, back onto the land. Because an urban uh, agriculture bill or initiative or whatever it develops from this meeting is not complete until the words community gardens and the recognition of community gardens are in, in that bill. Community gardens, there's 600 community gardens in the city. This room is filled with community gardeners. This room understands what community gardens provide to the city. They provide food sovereignty, they provide food security, they take away the walls that create food apartheid. And so what I want to do is talk about how we, as community gardeners, are working towards making this city sustainable and resilient. 
The mayor talks about making New York City a part of the Paris Climate Accords. You cannot be part of climate accords until you recognize the value of community gardens in this city. They provide carbon sequestration. They provide a, a, an answer to climate mitigation. And what they actually do is provide an answer for communities to come together and to work together and to provide sweat equity. You mentioned Cindy Worley. You mentioned all these wonderful people who've been here. Ray Figueroa is here. These people have worked there. They've worked very hard at making this happen. And so I urge this committee, I urge you, Mr. Espinal, who recognizes where we have to go, but I want you to get off the rooftops. There's no accessibility for people in communities. I mean, to, to be fair, when I, when I uh, drafted this bill, there's no, I had no intention of leaving community gardens out. Okay. Uh, if you feel that you're feeling left out because there's not a word that says community gardens in the bill, that's something that could be easily amended. But, um, you know, I'm from East New York, and I represent Bushwick. We all, all we have is community gardens for the most part. So there's no intention of leaving you out of the conversation. You will be part of the conversation as well. I don't feel like you intentionally did it. I feel like, um, I feel like there's never the, the, the words community garden are not always in the lexicon of how the city operates, and I want, I'd like to have that changed. I'd like, I think all of us here believe that. We believe in the urban ag part of this as well, for sure, but it has to be comprehensive. And one last thing on zoning, I think that if, if this bill creates an urban ag zone or zoning requirements, please, please, please include community gardens in a zoning uh, piece or garden districts that promote and preserve these gardens. We are all for affordable housing. Did you Most submit written testimony by any chance? I, I have it here. Did you submit it? I have not submitted okay. it. Okay. Well, you submit it. One last thing on, on just on affordable housing. Most people in this room who are community gardeners are, are able to get affordable housing, but not at the expense of taking our community gardens away. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Mariela Costa, and I'm uh, one of the volunteers at Bush Bushwick City Farm in Bed Bedford-Stuyvesant. Uh, thanks to the City Council Committee on Land Use for taking on this important issue and for allowing me to speak today. While discussing an urban agriculture plan for the city, I hope you will include a plan to acquire vo vulnerable community land such as Bushwick City Farm. As many of you already know, Bushwick City Farm is an urban agriculture space that also functions as a community space located across the street from the NYCHA Sumner houses. In 2008, some concerned community members began cleaning up an abandoned lot in the hopes of turning it into a farm. And since, since then, Bushwick City Farm has given away thousands of pounds of free organic produce, clothing, eggs, and local honey to the community. Over the years, we've also helped build gardens in NYCHA housing and local public schools. Bushwick City Farm uh, has a unique approach to urban agriculture that addresses many of the issues this bill has been called to address. For instance, our neighborhood is in a food desert or food apartheid area, just learned a new term. <laughs> uh, we are a food insecure community with limited access to healthy, locally grown organic food. Bushwick City Farm invites all neighbors to participate in growing and harvesting healthy food, thus serving as a model for sustainable urban production, urban food production. There is also a lack of green spaces in our neighborhood that cater to community members of all ages and backgrounds. Our farm is a popular green space that is open to everyone. Additionally, one of the main platforms of this bill is to provide youth development and education with regard to local food production. Neighborhood youth, neighborhood youth spend time at Bushwick City Farm learning firsthand how to take care of plants, develop carpentry skills, and apply new technologies like solar energy and aquaponics to urban agriculture. So currently, I will sum it up real quick. Uh, Bushwick City Farm is facing a possible eviction. Uh, this could be avoided if the city intervened to purchase the lot in order to make a city park or a green thumb farm. We are hoping that this bill can help us continue to use this land in the way the neighborhood has been using it for the last nine years. Zoning and creative land use plans could help us continue to work for a better New York and better underrepresented neighborhoods. Thank you. Thanks. Have you spoken to your council member? Yes, uh, we've been in touch with uh, the council member of our district and Carnegie, <laughs> Robert Carnegie. <laughs> 
um, and the president of the borough's office, the, bur the office of the president. Okay. Yeah. Great. Mm -hmm. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Next panel: Anor Anel Hernandez, Luisa Santos, Catherine Soul, Adriana Espinoza, Harrison Hillier. Good morning, Councilman Espinal. My name is Anel Hernandez, and I'm here to testify in support of Intro 1661 on behalf of the New York City Environmental Justice Alliance. Founded in 1991, NIJA is a nonprofit citywide membership network linking grassroots organizations from low income neighborhoods and communities of color in their struggle for environmental justice. NIJA empowers its member organizations to advocate for improved environmental conditions and against inequitable environmental burdens. Through our efforts, member organizations, including Nos Quedamos and the Point CDC in the Bronx, El Puente and Brooklyn Movement Center in Brooklyn, among others, coalesce around specific common issues that threaten the ability of low-income communities and communities of color to thrive and coordinate campaigns designed to affect city and state policies, including around community gardens, green infrastructure, urban agriculture um, policies directly benefiting these communities. Our organization has been a longtime advocate of community gardens, and we support Intro 1661 that requires the city to develop a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. Our member organizations come from communities overburdened by pollutant infrastructure, lacking green and open space, and lacking access to healthy foods, and NIJA recognizes urban agriculture as a key community resiliency strategy. Our New York City climate justice agenda is a multi-year research and advocacy campaign to address the needs for comprehensive community-based approaches to climate adaptation and community resiliency. We highlighted that community gardens are a much needed piece of green infrastructure to mitigate climate change, to deal with air quality and flooding and coastal resiliency, and a valuable asset for vulnerable communities. For example, a comprehensive approach to the growing threat of extreme heat should also take into consideration the multiple co-benefits associated with green spaces. While the city has provided support for community gardens and urban agriculture, we are troubled by the news that several community garden sites may be offered up for the development of housing. Um, finally, our urban agriculture is also an important piece of food resiliency. In the city's recently released Five Borough Food Flow report, they flagged that in the event of an emergency, low-income, geographically isolated consumers face additional vulnerabilities, particularly if they have already limited food choices under normal circumstances. This increases the need for a comprehensive food mapping at the community level so that emergency food supplies are readily assessed by the city's most accessed by the city's most vulnerable populations during hurricanes, blackouts, and other emergency scenarios. So Nija commends the city council and Councilman Espinal for, for uh, proposing intro 61, and we um, look forward to working with you to make sure that it passes. Good afternoon, my name is Adriana Espinosa. I'm the manager of the New York City program at the New York League of Conservation Voters. I'd like to thank uh, temporary Chair Espinal uh, and all members of the Committee of Elders for the opportunity to testify. The New York League of Conservation Voters strongly supports the development of a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. The City Council and the Mayor have demonstrated their commitment to urban agriculture through supporting programs like Health Bucks, Green Thumb Community Gardens, educational programs in schools, etc. But it's only through a comprehensive planning process can we improve sustainability and security of our food systems while ensuring equitable access to fresh, local, healthy produce. The need for a comprehensive approach in urban agriculture policy is demonstrated by the maze of city agencies, agencies who oversee our sustainability goals and those who manage regulation and approval of urban, urban agriculture projects. There does not currently exist a centralized place for urban agriculture programs and processes 
and we are pleased that this is one important question that the bill will address. Cultivating urban agriculture in the city is inherently challenging given our heavily developed, densely populated city environment, but these challenge can be, challenges can be exacerbated by a lack of clarity in zoning and regulations. We need a clear, modern, and streamlined approach to urban agriculture policy. Perhaps the most critical component of the plan to are to examine amendments to the zoning code to clearly define permissible urban agriculture practices for both individual and commercial interests in each zoning district. Other specific zoning resolutions, building code, and fire code changes that should be explored include feasibility of allowing urban agriculture in all districts, uh, expanding as of right use for small scale projects, and simplifying the permit application and regulatory process processes for conditional uses such as rooftop or vertical farming. Uh, intro 1661 also calls for cataloging existing and potential urban agricultural spaces. Um, and we encourage attention to a couple of, of externalities uh, that are unique to the city. Uh, one I'll point out is given the city's rich industrial history and poor environmental safety practices of, of decades past, soil quality and remediation must be taken into consideration when cataloging potential ground level urban agricultural spaces. And to conclude, uh, there are many environmental benefits to reducing the physical space between cultivation and consumption of fresh food, How, uh, fewer emissions, less reliance on fossil fuels. For example, a more sophisticated approach to urban agriculture does not replace the need to invest in protection of our regional food shed, but so long as attention is paid to energy intensity of large-scale projects, a robust urban agriculture plan um, is a benefit to a more sustainable food system um, and increasing access to fresh produce overall. Thank you. Um, thank you, Councilmember Espinal, um, for hearing public testimony on the proposal for a comprehensive urban agriculture plan. Uh, I am Luisa Santos, Equitable Public Space Fellow with the Design Trust for Public Space, a nonprofit dedicated to the future of public space in New York City. Design Trust brings projects, um, brings together city agencies and community groups to make a lasting impact through design on how New Yorkers live, work, and play. Uh, over uh, our projects over the past 20 years have included saving the High Line with our feasibility study and developing the sustainability guidelines that became the precursor to New York City's local law 86 and now one NYC. Uh, our project on urban agriculture, Fibro Farm, was a multi-phase project conducted in partnership with Added Value, New York City Parks, and Farming Concrete. Fibro Farm offered a roadmap to farmers and gardeners, city officials, and stakeholders to understand the and weigh the benefits of urban agriculture. The first phase of Five Borough Farm resulted in policy recommendations, including the creation of an urban agriculture plan that would establish goals, objectives, and a citywide land use scheme for garden and farm de development, integrate urban agriculture into existing plans, programs, and policy making processes, and address disparities in access to funding, information, and other resources by creating transparent and participatory processes to enable gardeners and farmers to influence po policy and decision making. Our recommendations released in 2012 align with the current proposal. Uh, however, systems of accountability are essential to maximize the benefits of a plan for all New Yorkers. The plan must apply not only to commercial urban agriculture, but also to community gardens uh, and all other forms of gardening and farming practice. We urge the City Council to incorporate the following three means to measure accountability in the generation and execution of the plan. One, a citywide task force composed of city agency support organizations and gardeners. Um, two, open forums at many points in the plan's development process, including input gathering in each borough. Three, communication within the city and with gardening and farming support organization and advocate networks. Uh, we recognize that this is an aggressive time frame. Nonetheless, the process will be critical to ensuring the effect effectiveness of the plan. Uh, to conclude, um, let's make sure that the needs of all gardeners and farmers are included in a citywide comprehensive urban agriculture plan. Thank you. Uh, thank you for hearing our testimony. I'm Harrison Hillier, the hydroponics manager at Teens for Food Justice. And for time, I'd like to note that this is a joint statement with uh, Kathy Soule, the founder of Teens for Food Justice. In 2016, Teens for Food Justice, our social justice, urban agricultural not-for-profit, built its second indoor hydroponic farm at a Title I school in bed -Stuy. Urban Assembly Unison is a Title I community school where more than 90% of the students are eligible for free and reduced lunch and serve a largely food insecure community. 
The wholesome produce grown by the students at our farm nourishes the bodies of the students who plant the seeds and watch over the crops until harvest. In 2016 school year, our farm, situated in a repurposed science classroom, grew more than 1,100 pounds of produce, which students enjoy in the cafeteria and distribute to schools' families. As they grow food for their school cafeteria and community, our students learn about nutrition, health, food policy, and social justice. They share this, in, this knowledge with others, transforming them into advocates who can help their community gain access to resources it sorely needs. This nourishing effect ripples outwards, placing students and their families on a path toward improving their health through greater consumption of fruits and vegetables and better nutrition. Independent evaluations over the last three years have shown that more than 50% of TFFJ students feel more confident in science, see themselves as leaders, and believe that they can make a difference in their communities after completing just one semester with the program. In addition, 70% report understanding the importance of eating fruits and vegetables and, how consi and consider themselves healthy eaters. Teens for Food Justice is currently completing construction of our third youth-built, youth-run farm at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, which is set to grow more than 20,000 pounds. Yeah, excuse me, ma'am. Can you identify yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. uh, I'm Catherine Saul. I'm the CEO and founder of Teens for Food Justice. So we are completing construction of our third youth-built, youth-run farm at DeWitt Clinton High School in the Bronx, which is set to grow more than 20,000 pounds, 10 tons of produce annually. This food will be consumed by students in the cafeteria each day and distributed free and affordably directly into the local food and secure community, significantly increasing healthy food access in that area. The farm will provide integrated STEM learning to 100 students annually, real life preparation for urban agricultural careers in higher education and a nutrition education and healthy food access hub that can improve health outcomes for thousands of community members. Additional farms on this scale are in development in Manhattan and Brooklyn. 1661 would expedite and streamline the implementation process, enabling youth front run farms such as these and the benefits they bring to rapidly expand throughout the city. To ensure the proliferation of projects such as these, and there are many, um, that both nourish New Yorkers of all ages in all boroughs and provide rich educational and workforce development experiences for the next generation, we highly support this bill in its efforts to create a clear and comprehensive plan to bl and a blueprint for growth. In addition, we support the development of a comprehensive urban agriculture policy that can build this growing industry, thus providing a workforce pipeline for the students we train. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you. Just, for, just to clear this up, so, so the League is supportive of the bill? Yes. Okay, great. Thank you. Appreciate you all. Tinia Pina, Caroline Sazima, Albert Williams, Ricky Stevens, Holly O'Grady. I think the clock has been changed to one minute, so please give me your elevator pitch. Best Not a problem. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Tania Pina. I'm one of the founding members of New York City Agricultural Collective and representing a company called Renewable. And what Renewable is doing is providing an innovative business model where we take food, for, food waste from grocers and wholesale produce distributors and we turn it into a soil um, fertilizer as well as hydroponic fertilizer that's a dry and liquid form. And we want to bring up the topic and theme of food waste that should definitely be considered in this bill, which we're supportive of, is because of the fact that a lot of times um, from the upstream providers of these farms as well as who they sell to have an abundance of food waste. And we've proven the ability to uh, divert a tremendous amount of carbon emissions. So we can show that 86, per, 86 reduction compared to um, tra transporting a lot of that food waste to distant composting facilities, such as in Long Island or even Peninsula Compost, and used to be in Delaware, um, whereas us helping the city 
compost or, or process this food waste locally uh, will definitely help the city meet its carbon emissions reductions. That was really good, by the way. <laughs> uh, hello, can you hear me? Uh, good morning. I am Carolyn Zesma. I am the president and chief consultant for NYC Foodscape, a local food systems and urban ag consulting business. I want to express my general support for the com proposed comprehensive urban ag plan creation process um, as a great step toward long-term resilience, economic opportunity, food security, health, and community sovereignty for all New York City residents. It's the planning process itself that I wish to quickly comment on and focus. Um, most of my background in urban ag is in my uh, longer statements, but I do have a deep history in urban ag, including starting an urban farm in Evanston, Illinois in 2006, and at least seven projects here in New York. I uh, applaud all urban ag, but I focus specifically on those that work in the community and on the ground. Um, and one of my ch most ch cherished projects is the Children's Garden at Campos uh, community garden, which was started af in the wake of Hurricane Sandy when our local school gave us money to repair the garden. I do want to say very quickly uh, about the uh, plan that the entrepreneurial food access, environmental, and public health potential of urban agriculture that this plan could lay the groundwork for is clearly vast. The bill's plan brings with it many areas that need input, and here's where I think the important part is. In either in the form of a task force or other formal structure from all stakeholders, from resident and citizens groups, gardeners, community-based organizations, health providers, housing providers, educators, entrepreneurs, philanthropists, and advocates. The plan will need the on-the-ground experience and expertise of those who have led the way, many of which you have heard from today, uh, and hear from those whose whose needs the plan seeks to address, to delve deeper into the specifics of the plan, some of which are written in your proposed uh, law right now. But one of the things that I think absolutely needs to be explored, um, in addition to incentives for uh, all types of agriculture, um, is ensuring that the, uh, that the knowledge and expertise of existing community and backyard uh, and rooftop gardeners and farmers are included and that the plan is equitable, gives New York City residents in all communities, especially those who need it the most, an equal and increased share of the land access and tenure necessary to grow their own food and retain some degree of sovereignty over their food system. I would be very happy to work with you and to uh, give you my continued input as this plan develops and feel free to contact me at any time if you Thank you. like Appreciate more input. It. Hello, I'm Ricky Stevens. I'm a founder of AgTech X, a Brooklyn-based startup. Uh, I strongly support Bill 1661 and really all forms of urban agriculture, including community gardening, but I want to speak strictly about the economic development opportunity from my perspective. So at AgTech X, we serve as a hub for learning, inspiration, and collaboration within the urban farming and ag tech world. We currently run what we refer to as New York City's only ag tech co-working lab. Uh, using our space as a hub to connect into the industry, We've hosted over uh, hundreds of visitors in, in our sh five short months of running the space. These are primarily New York City residents, but others have come from all over. Brazil, France, Japan, Australia, to name just a few. Their ambitions vary too. Many young local professionals are seeking jobs in a more sustainability and impact-driven field, while some of our international visitors have come to size up the opportunity for bringing their existing businesses here. All of these visitors consider New York City to be at the forefront of innovation when it comes to food, technology, and urban design, the foundations to encourage rapid business growth in the urban agriculture field. My fear, however, is that as these enthusiastic professionals uncover the more hidden barriers to entry and their associated risks and costs, they will flee for greener pastures, literally. Chicago in 2011, Baltimore in 2013, Boston, as already mentioned by the council member, and Los Angeles in 2015 are just a few of the many U.S. cities that have already adopted comprehensive urban agriculture plans or made supportive amendments to zoning policies to spur the growth of this industry. New York City has been behind the curve. Let's use this bill to change that. Thank you. Hi, my name is Holly O'Grady. Hit the button on your mic. Sorry. Hi, my name is Holly O'Grady, and I'm representing um, 
Art Losada Foundation and Garden Stories Leadership Workshops. And I'm also proud to say that we've worked very closely with the Campus Garden and Carolyn Zezima. Our concern is primarily education, connecting children to opportunities to learn actively through green spaces that are available or nearby schools. So we support a plan, a mindful use of that space. Uh, the concern is to make sure that these spaces are accessible to the community and to children, and that there is a plan for a sustained and systemic educational program. And um, I've included photos of very happy children who've gone through our workshops, and they speak volumes. Thank you. Hello, my name is Albert Williams. Uh, thank you for having me today. Um, I'm a student at the CUNY School of Public Health, um, research coordinator at Mount Sinai Hospital. I'm um, also a lifetime resident of Brooklyn, New York. Um, and so in my own experience, I've had plenty of trouble finding healthy food, even in my own neighborhood and other boroughs in New York City. Um, and when it comes to urban agriculture, this is something that I've personally had to really go out and search for to even know what exists in my community. And my concern is that this is even more difficult for people of low income and other communities um, who have other barriers um, who aren't students in public health, um, and so, and also have barriers to accessibility. Um, so I have two amendments today. My first was about um, explicitly mentioning uh, rooftop gardens um, because of its clean soil opportunities, um, as well as space utilization, but also um, integrating um, communities um, in urban agriculture. So I think that um, if we are able to uh, use marketing, community events, um, and other health initiatives as points of access. Um, we can not only make sure that urban agriculture exists uh, in communities where it's most needed, but also really address the needs of these communities and invite people to actually participate and have urban agriculture as a part of their lives as opposed to complements. So, thank you. Thank you. Tatiana, um, I, I would love to follow up on the food waste conversation. Uh, it's one of the issues I, I try to tackle here in the council as well. Sure, we'd appreciate that. Yeah, we have uh, Rick Arbella, my legislative director there. If you can just give us your contact information. Absolutely, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all, thank you. Thank you. Robert uh, Lane, Daniel Gading, Henry Sweets, Alice Forbes Spen, and sorry if I mispronounced your name, uh, Raymond Figueroa, Jr. Uh, yeah, so I'm Robert Lang, uh, and I represent Farm One. We're a vertical farm, actually a few blocks away in Tribeca, very much in support of 1661. Um, I'm coming at this pretty much from a commercial angle. We founded the company about a year ago. We have a new farm that we've built in a basement of a landmark building in the city. Uh, we now employ 10 people, uh, and we're just at the beginning. So, you know, the difficulties that we've faced have really been, as some people have mentioned, that... Um, there's just not a lot of clarity around what can be done. Um, and I think that a bill that introduces some clarity w will have a ripple effect across other departments. So, for instance, when we interact with people from the Department of Buildings or the Department of Health or the Fire Department, uh, it would be great to have some kind of structure in place that would allow us as a business to know that we're doing the right thing um, and also allow us to be confident that we can grow and that New York is supporting us as a business. So very much in support of any bill that can do that. Thanks. Daniel Goodin from Isabella Farm in Brownsville, Brooklyn. First of all, I would like to thank everyone in this room and thank you, sir, um, for holding this hearing because um, I come from a neighborhood where there's a lot of elders, a lot of sickly people, and we have been able to provide food to people that would normally not be able to purchase it at a, at a low price or, or even give it away free. Um, our main focus is to educate the young people in the neighborhood. Um, being a former Future Farmer of America from Virginia, I thought it was important that, you know, 4-H and Future Farmers should be discussed. We don't talk about those things in school. 
but every last one of our gardens, which we have six that we provide, is, is around the school. And now the feedback is maybe we should do more farming in the schools and have access. But the, the, the problem seemed to be that money and how do we generate funds for people that's even coming home for reentry programs. That that's all they're doing upstate is farming, but when they come home, you can't even give them a job. So I hope in the planning process that you would take in consideration all the things that I spoke about and all the things that the people talked about, because it was a wealth of information here today. And I thank you all, you know, for supporting this. You, you have a farm in Howard Houses? I am the manager for, yes, sir. Um, I, I refused. I opted out that day when you came not to take the picture with you, but uh, <laughs> I was hiding. Mm -hmm. um, but um, yes, Howard but Houses. I, I, yeah, I bring it up because I remember being there, and a, a, a young man who learned how to farm, do that farm, wanted to be a compost director. Yes. And I just found that amazing to just be able to see young people from, from the neighborhood being able to learn uh, skills that aren't traditionally available to them. So I just wanted just to highlight that. And thank you for supporting him, and um, that's what we try to do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Henry Sweets. I'm a co-founder of the urban farming business, North Brooklyn Farms. Thanks for having me today. Uh, five years ago, uh, North Brooklyn Farms worked with two other organizations to transform a vacant lot into a one-acre public park located on private property owned by Two Trees Development. We now operate our own half-acre green space on the East River at the former Domino Sugar Refinery. Our farm is full of flowers, vegetables, edible medicinal herbs, and trees <clears throat> and two expansive grassy lawns. We use agriculture as a tool to engage our visitors and have created a green space at a fraction of the cost of a city park. Uh, since we're located on private property, we host events that fund the entire project, create hundreds of thousands of dollars of revenue annually, and create jobs. Uh, we've also exhibited that uh, urban farms can activate temporary spaces and um, continue to pave a viable path for the next generation of urban farmers. Hundreds of local families frequent our space and thousands of visitors come to our farm every week. Uh, as you consider the value of urban agriculture, please consider that urban farming has an impact beyond the produce that it grows. Um, it can also be a tool to create a unique and inclusive community space. Thanks. Hi, my name is Alice Forbes Spear, and I'm a founding member of the 462 Halsey Community Farm in bed -Stuy. Since 2002, our space has gone through a number of transformations, long abandoned lot to community garden, community garden to New York City Park, to its latest iteration as a fully functioning volunteer-run urban farm. We've struggled through myriad projects in this time, from the age-old question, how do we get water, to the age-older question, how do we channel all of our differences as a community to create something valuable. Our successes have been greater than our struggles. Every week, more than 100 families participate in Grow NYC's fresh food box at our farm. We have a sliding scale farmer's market that allows every resident in our gentrified neighborhood to buy affordable organic vegetables with dignity and respect. We have diverted nearly 100 tons of food waste into compost to nourish our crops. But I'm not here today to talk about our successes. We have this book for that. We gave you guys a copy. Instead, I'm here to talk about how we aren't reaching our potential. Taking pride in our resourcefulness does not mean that we don't need, wish we had more support from the city. For the past two years, our space has thrown all of its resources into installing a long-term irrigation system powered by solar panels. That project took all of our budget and all of our time. As spaces like ours get more ambitious in scope, we, as we become more necessary in the face of climate change and rising food prices, we need more from the city. Some of us need support for infrastructure projects. All of us could use more people power, which is an opportunity for the city to invest in urban agriculture as well as green jobs for young people. I got my start at Eagle Street Rooftop Farm. Like many young hipsters, I thought I was at the forefront of the urban agriculture movement. The more I learned, the more I realized the error and arrogance of my beliefs. I was not part of the vanguard. The vanguard was the Karen Washingtons, Jeanette Flemings, Brenda Duchesne's, and my own personal garden hero, Ina McPherson. These women, like others before them, have been getting the job done, and then some for decades. They've created farmers markets, green jobs, community spaces, labors of love that nourished their neighborhoods long before kale was trendy. If you want to learn what will feed our city in the future, look to the past. Thank you. More, but. <clears throat> Did you submit testimony? Me? Yep. Yes, it's inside of our book. 
Okay, great. Much longer. Thank <laughs> you. We'll read it. Thank you. Hello and good afternoon. Peace and blessings. Uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is uh, Raymond Figueroa Jr. I have over two decades of experience in agriculture, 13 of which are in urban agriculture. I am president of the New York City Community Garden Coalition. I am on the faculty of the Graduate Center for Planning in the Environment at the Pratt Institute Graduate School of Architecture, where I focus my work on the land use ramifications of urban agriculture. So this is the perfect uh, uh, opportunity here. I'm also director of an Alternatives to Incarceration Initiative at the Youth Community Farm of the Brook Park Community Garden. Cutting to the chase. Uh, in order for the city of New York to develop and implement a comprehensive, a truly comprehensive urban agricultural plan, it must comprehensively reconcile the implicit competition uh, with its rezoning for affordable housing plan. The city must, in the interest of rightfully promoting the public good in the fullest sense, thoughtfully consider the following. Just as it can and must adapt the food retail exp uh, expansion to support health, fresh initiative incentives, the city of New York can and must implement a redeployment of its rezoning and tax exempt exemptions currently earmarked for affordable housing development and consider additional rezoning and additional tax incentives for housing development that includes the development of community-based agriculture and it must further do so in particular where such housing plans overlap with the city's fresh geographic criteria for the siting of supermarkets, uh, in this case adapting that for the siting of uh, urban farms, and where that plan overlaps with the city's Department of Environmental Protection's uh, geographic designation of combined sewer overflow tributary areas. Uh, to be sure in this regard, not only do community gardens, community farms collectively constitute both uh, an infrastructure for urban agriculture, but they bring the added value of providing an already built up and cost effective green infrastructure for mitigating stormwater flooding and runoff. Finally, Thank you, Raymond. I have, I have to ask you to conclude. Yeah. Finally. Finally, um, the simultaneous and strategic deployment of transfer of development rights and or purchase of development rights and the related utilization of community land trusts can allow for the, uh, the three goals of, an, of developing an urban agricultural infrastructure, the development of a green infrastructure for mitigating uh, extreme weather events, and at the same time, the development of affordable housing. Thank you. Thank Can you. I say one more thing very quickly? The market on urban agriculture has all been focused on pouring millions of dollars into startups that grow microgreens, and humanity can't survive on microgreens. I mean, like some self-starving New Yorkers can, but we need calorie-rich, nutrient-dense food like squash and beans, and the market is not able to, you know, like, investments we're trying, are we're not being made We're trying to expand opportunities. So yeah, we're, we're going like to, we're going to, we're, we're trying to grow. accomplish the expansion yeah. of opportunities. Real food, so, not you. just kale. I love kale, but you know. <laughs> thank you all. Appreciate it. Next panel, Claudia Joseph, Simon Roberts, Kendra uh, Vale, Elizabeth Vaknin, and Mara Kravitz. Uh, I'm Claudia Joseph. I'm a 30-year uh, community gardener, uh, an instructor at New York Botanic Garden, a permaculture teacher, consultant, and designer, and the director of environmental education at the Old Stone House in Brooklyn. Uh, I support uh, the introduction of 1661, and thank you, uh, Councilperson Espinal, to, for um, bringing this out into the public and allowing us to say our piece. Um, I agree with Aziz and the other uh, 
community gardeners who are bringing together uh, the benefits uh, of having community gardens. I'll go beyond that and say that in addition to community gardens, we can have them at every library, school, and park. Um, my own landscape has been under development for 12 years. We have about an acre of the three-acre park in gardens now. It is a uh, colonially-based model, but it produces food, medicine, craft material, wildlife habitat, and stormwater infrastructure. Uh, training programs can be created in our communities uh, to um, create foodways, foodscapes, food forests, in public places where perhaps we haven't considered gardening before. Every woody shrub that we plant is a carbon sink uh, in its bark and roots, and becoming aware that soil is alive is one of our greatest potential uh, places to store carbon. It's a re revelation to many non-gardeners that carbon sequestration uh, is uh, available in the soil and that this is an avenue we might pursue in dealing with climate uh, mitigation. Uh, there are many Maxie, lots. Maxie, please conclude the, your statement. Hmm? Please conclude your statement. Yes, sir. Um, there are a lot of parcels that are available to farm, and I believe in-ground farming is our, our most economical uh, and offers the best resources for our communities in moving forward with urban agriculture. Thank you. My name is Simon Roberts. I have been a farm hand in many farms in the city. I definitely support 1661, and thank you for bringing this to uh, the attention of all the uh, people that need to hear about it. I can't say anything that anyone has ever said, that anyone hasn't already said, but what I can state and put urgency on is the physical and mental health of an entire generation is at stake. And to that effect, I'd actually like to share a story. There were two farmers who desperately needed rain. However, only one of them went out to the field and prepared it to receive the rain. Which farmer is New York City? Can the health of future generations really afford to wait any longer for us to invest in them? And I would actually like to challenge you uh, today to actually consolidate all of the insights that you've heard from all the testimonials and present them publicly. So that's a good place to start, at least. And I, myself, and I'm sure several others in this audience would like to help with that as well. My name is Kendra Valle, and I'm testifying on behalf of East New York Farms, which I assume you're familiar with, as um, many of the gardens that we work with are in your district. Um, so I'll skip the part about our work. Um, we're very much in support of this proposal, and we just want to share a few of our thoughts. We want to make sure that community gardens remain at the forefront of any conversation about urban agriculture in New York City. While any single garden may not look as impressive as a rooftop farm or a hydroponic greenhouse, when taken as a whole, community gardens constitute a much larger part of our local food system than any of the more high visibility farm projects. Community gardens are also an important part of the legacy of land stewardship in some of the communities hit hardest by redlining, arson, abandonment, and neglect. Community gardens bring together residents of all ages and all backgrounds. In East New York, you find gardeners from the American South, the Caribbean, West Africa, and Bangladesh, all working together in the same space to feed their families. Um, so in conclusion, we appreciate this effort to bring a broad range of city agencies um, to the table. We would like to encourage that the council also consider um, the Department of Sanitation, which has been a key partner for many urban farms in providing compost. Um, the Department of Environmental Protection, which should also be at the table, um, considering the benefits that urban agriculture has on the overburdened sewer system. Um, and we also believe that some of the agencies and institutions holding large amounts of public land should also be at the table, NYCHA, communities, public schools, and colleges. Um, so that's my conclusion. Thank you. I'm Mara Kravitz, and I'm the Director of Partnerships at 596 Acres. We champion resident stewardship of land to build more just and equitable cities. Um, we believe that communities should have a say in how land in their neighborhoods is used and by whom. I'm so glad that this new law can support our network of hundreds of growers across New York City. 
Um, I'm generally supportive, and I'm glad the language of the bill includes uh, resilience because this is uh, the story of the development of urban agriculture in New York City. Um, urban agriculture in New York City, um, most of the community gardens are in formerly redlined areas, that is areas that were effectively cut off from investment, which was mapped out on institutionally racist Hulk uh, infamous redlining maps. So resilience means facing these challenging cir circumstances, coming out stronger, that's what we want to do. So let's make sure that this plan grows from and honors these roots. To do that, we can give clear instructions to DCP and other agencies about how to develop the plan so that any additional zoning mapping and additional investment, entrepreneurship, resources can be decided by the people to whom we owe this rich history, the people who will be, be most impacted by the decisions, so that's people who live nearby and people who've been stewarding land for a long time and growing there already. Um, in addition, um, the language can talk about justice and equity. If new enterprises want to come here, they can uh, be connected with existing uh, people who are stewarding land to make sure that they are steered in ways um, by people who already know how to make their community stronger. Um, finally, I'll conclude, um, when it comes to investment in this, the plan can also prioritize forms of investment that will truly build community wealth. And I'm thinking here about credit unions and um, other forms of cooperative investing uh, to make, and along with that, cooperative enterprises can run additional uh, farms so that the benefits from these projects can be shared. Thank you. Hi, my name is Liz Vaknin, and I'm here on behalf of my company, Our Name is Farm, but also as a member of the New York City Ag Collective. I'd like to speak to three things that haven't been mentioned today. The first is the connection between local food and our local uh, business economy with regards to restaurants, chefs, distributors, which is what my company uh, specializes in, connecting those people. There's been a growing consumer demand for local food. A lot of it is inaccessible because of price. I think that if we create more opportunities for farms to grow in the city, that price will be driven down and local access to food will become more rampant and chefs will be able to include that more on their menus. The second thing is agritourism. My company gets hired often by tourism boards across the country. There's no reason why New York City can't become a destination for agritourism, much like it already kind of has been, but we can do a lot better job on that front. And from a personal perspective, as the daughter of a real estate developer, I actually don't think that real estate developers in this city know what to do with all the extra space that they have. And if there was a comprehensive guide from the city to instruct them in a way that was I guess financially beneficial to them, we would have more cooperation from these real estate corporations, and I think that there needs to be a guide uh, to instruct these people on how to do so. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you all. Next panel, Molly Culver, Jason Green, Alina Ortiz, Paula Siegel. I don't know, I think Paula left. All right, Paula's not around. Uh, Eliza Roth. Hello everyone, my name is Alicia Ortiz, and I'm happy I got to speak right after the young lady that just spoke. Uh, I'm a real estate agent here in New York. I'm with Keller Williams Tribeca, and as a New Yorker, born and raised in Williamsburg, and as a real estate agent here in the city, I'm in full support of this bill. As an agent, I've seen property values boost when rooftop and vertical gardens are integrated into buildings. These innovative designs or retrofitted properties provide the real estate market with new and different inventory, which is much needed as the market has an excess of the same and now redundant apartments and buildings. This is causing a market in decline right now. I've spoken to people who have purchased in these spaces and they describe them as a true oasis. And this is a selling point in a city which is now characterized by metal and concrete. As someone born here in the city, I'm proud that this initiative is finally taking place. As a city, we're regarded by the world as forward-thinking in fashion, in finance, and entertainment, 
and now we can be a leader in green initiatives. We have the opportunity and the responsibility to use these advancements in technology to build a better quality of city life. We can create jobs and usher in a new era of green driven real estate and our laws should facilitate and encourage this. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Jason Green, and I'm the CEO and co-founder at Edenworks. Edenworks is a vertical aquaponic farming company. We are based in East Williamsburg, uh, and we grow leafy greens and fish. I'm testifying today to both the opportunity and the challenges uh, uh, for New York's urban agriculture industry. To start with the opportunity, uh, the city has a goal of 100,000 new well-paying jobs by 2030. Manufacturing, food manufacturing specifically is essential to that goal. Over the past five years, U.S. jobs overall have grown by 2.5%. Manufacturing has grown by 6.5%. Despite substantial effort to spur New York's manufacturing industry, we've actually lost 3% of jobs. Food manufacturing has been the rare bright spot, uh, growing by 10% in the fast, past five years. Um, and New York City accounts for a third of all uh, manu uh, of a third of all of New York State's food manufacturing jobs, more than any other region. Uh, food manufacturing is also responsible not just for jobs numbers growth, but wage growth. Manufacturing jobs have average wages of $15,000 higher and 12% higher in food manufacturing. Um, just to, to briefly uh, flip to the challenge, uh, there, is, uh, there, is, there are uh, some primary challenges to this industry in New York. Uh, energy costs in New York City are twice that uh, in upstate New York and uh, in New Jersey. Certain legislation creates regulatory uncertainty and actually disincentivizes uh, green industries like uh, urban agriculture, especially indoor agriculture. Um, and uh, and the, uh, the nature of incentives in New York has done a very good job of incentivizing the construction of residential and commercial spaces to meet the growing demand in New York. Uh, what has not uh, been addressed is the need to address the substantial capital expenditures that operators like food manufacturers spend outside of the traditional real estate development model. Hi, Councilman Espinal. Thank you so much for holding this hearing. And my name is Molly Culver. I am the farm manager at the Youth Farm, which is a one-acre or in-ground urban farm located at Wingate Campus in Crown Heights. Um, I've been involved in lots of different areas of urban agriculture since 2005. Um, and while I'm in a room with many other people who've been in this work so much longer than I have, um, I, I do feel compelled to come and speak today just out of concern for making sure that this process is equitable moving forward and that if we're talking about a comprehensive plan that we're really making sure that it is comprehensive and not just responding to new kind of excitement around the potential for increased urban agriculture and green jobs, which I fully recognize and I'm also excited about. Um, so I also work for Farm School NYC, which is one of the uh, primary uh, outlets for people who are learning to train in different aspects of urban agriculture, looking at jobs. Um, and so uh, I do want to encourage um, moving forward that, uh, especially for folks who identify as having white privilege in this room, that we are always being aware of that privilege and including others, people who have been at the forefront of this movement for decades. Um, and. Uh, that's essentially my point, is just to uh, encourage people who have been around in this movement at the table, who know the benefits of urban agriculture, um, the many, many benefits that they are here in the room as we move forward and make this plan. And I'm certainly excited to be a part of that process and also figure out ways that uh, in-ground farms that rely on production, such as the youth farm, um, for a means to move forward, uh, are able to provide food for uh, DOE schools. Um, that's something that we've had difficulty gaining traction in here in this city, and we know how important even access to a small eight by four foot plot is for one child. So uh, an urban farm that's one acre in ground, um, it should be able to provide food for uh, city cafeterias, especially Title I schools. So thank you. I would love to continue the conversation on the DOE aspect. So uh, I'll have my staff reach out to you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name's Alyssa Roth. Uh, I'm here just as an individual representing myself, and I'm a job seeker in the urban ag and ag tech industry. Um, I think that this is much more than individual hobbyists and environmental benefits. I think there's uh, significant open market opportunities for small business owners to generate revenues and create jobs. 
Um, there are hundreds of New Yorkers just like me aiming to establish careers in the urban ag tech sector. Um, my background is in clean energy finance and clean energy policy, and I'm aiming to transfer that and those skills to the sector that I believe addresses one of the most important issues facing New York City, which is urban agriculture. I'm currently a resident of Westchester County, and my relocation to New York City is reliant upon finding a job in urban ag. And while the industry is still in the nascent phase, well-paying jobs are still far and few between. I would love to see New York City support urban ag and am for 1661 to help bolster the industry and the jobs that will become available to a ready and waiting workforce. Thank you. Thank you all. Appreciate it. Daniel Wall, Wythe Marshall, Jacob Rode, Barry Rothstein, Victor Flores. Can you, can you all state your names? Just make sure there's one person missing. All right, so let me see. Is Daniel here? Wythe? Jacob? Barry? All right, Victor's gone. Let me begin. Hi, my name is Daniel Wall. Um, I'm a student at Columbia University getting a degree at Master's of Public Administration, Environmental Science and Policy. Um, I'm interested in urban agriculture, and I don't think I can really add too much more to the conversation other than I'm also from Westchester County, um, and I'm part of a group up there that are trying to promote urban agriculture, and we're coming up to similar issues that are facing the city, uh, dealing with agricultural districting. Uh, so as mentioned earlier, that it would be beneficial to make connections between New York City urban agriculture and also promoting uh, peri-urban agriculture and even farming upstate and making those connections. Um, and so in Westchester County, we, uh, we have to wait another seven years to address agricultural districting, but I think there can be some connections made between movements going on in the city and also in areas around the city where there is plentiful amount of space for, for agriculture to take hold. Uh, hello, my name is Wythe Marshall. I'm an anthropologist of technology. I'm doing my PhD uh, right now, and I'm also a member at AgTech X uh, as my primary field site. And I wanted to voice support of the bill uh, for many reasons that have already been stated, but largely because of this aspect of community or the comprehensive nature of the plan. The Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations actually calls for cities to develop comprehensive urban and peri-urban agriculture plans. Uh, and again. Boston has been a leader, Atlanta's been a leader, and now I think it, it would be great as a New Yorker of over a decade uh, if New York sort of stood up and um, took this initiative. So I want to thank uh, Councilmember Espinal for developing what seems to be from a, a short framework a, a truly comprehensive plan that does speak to community gardens, which are absolutely, absolutely vital. Um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll end there because so much has already been said, and it's wonderful just to hear from so many voices across sort of entrepreneurship as well as community groups. Thank you. Hello. Hello, fellow New Yorkers, members of the City Council. My name is Jacob Roday, and I'm a grad student studying, uh, researching the effects of sustainable urban agriculture in New York City. I've concluded that establishing an environment in which urban farming can thrive is absolutely necessary for the overall sustainability of New York. The first step towards meeting this goal is creating a simpler regulatory framework in which urban farmers can succeed as well as gardeners, urban gardeners as well. My research indicates that urban ag is already positively impacting the lives of everyday people living in New York City, as everyone has testified. Urban farming lowers the cost of fresh produce, increases food security through access to healthy and nutritious food, establishes a new local economy for communities, and stimulates job creation and education. These benefits will not be possible in the current patchwork of guidance, regulation, and oversight. The evidence strongly suggests that legislation should strive to allow any urban farmer of every size and scale to obtain the right to grow and sell their produce in New York. Legislation is obligated to include regulations and guidelines on zoning, land use, health inspections, licensing, access to open, fair, and equitable markets, tax incentives for developing empty plots into farms, technology integration, environmental impact statements, 
the works. New York City's sustainability hinges on the success of creating a comprehensive urban agriculture plan and the eventual creation of the Office of Urban Agriculture. I implore you to consider the research and evidence presented in the testimony, not only mine, but the 38 people who went before me who are much more experienced, and I uh, thank you for your time, and have a great day. Appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs> I'll try to. <laughs> you, you better. Hi, my name is Barry Rothstein. I'm a student at Brooklyn College studying urban sustainability. Uh, I've been involved in the urban food movement here in New York since about 2010. Uh, I went back to school because I saw a lot of the potential inequity that could happen in this uh, urban food movement. So I realize as I'm looking at 45, 43, I'm going to just bullet point it, I think, uh, we spoke a lot about equity, we spoke a lot about community gardens. I think those are very strong take homes. Uh, I was a little remiss to not hear the word community land trust not used as much, and I think uh, that would be my takeaway. Uh, I think land rights and land access need to be in conjunction with a lot of this discussion, and I realize a year is a very short amount of time, but I think the conversation needs to be had, and as I see 11, 10, 9, I'm gonna leave it at that. Thank you. I think that's it. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I mean, this was a very, very yeah, informative sure. hearing. I, I've, I've actually learned a lot listening uh, from all of you, and then I also yeah, it's, heard it's an of a lot of future um, opportunities as well, uh, not only to amend the bill, but also to introduce new, le new legislation and make uh, uh, different type of pushes as well around urban ag. So again, this is um, a framework. This is something that I introduced um, to hopefully uh, brought in and also pushed the, the administration, the mayor's side, uh, to take on the work, to be able to push their the agencies to sit around a table and figure out what are the issues, right? And this is also, this is also, I need, I need everyone to understand, this is just not for a urban ag industry. This is for everyone, right? What are the rules? You know, let, this would inspire people who probably are afraid to uh, inv get involved in urban ag because they're not sure what the rules are to get to be able to do that as well. So this is about expanding and making sure that every plot of land can to be turned into an urban garden, that every rooftop can be turned into an urban garden. But this, this is about expanding urban ag across our entire city. So thank you all. Thank you all for being here. Appreciate it.